Good morning and welcome. I'm David Wessel, Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. Thank you for joining us for today's event. Uh, the Fed, what lessons have been learned or should they learn for the past three years? The mission of the Hutchins Center is to improve the quality and efficacy of fiscal and monetary policy and public understanding of it. And I think what we're doing today fits into all parts of that mission. Uh, the past three years have been very unusual a global pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in a century, uh, a consumer price index, which peaked uh, at 9% year over year, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a new Fed framework. And we think that the Federal Reserve needs to hear from outsiders about what it should know and what it should learn, and particularly what it should do in the future so that it can do a better job at managing these difficult situations. Uh, now, let me say a word about why we have this particular cast. Um, I've gotten some criticism that there's nobody here who hates the Fed, and that's true. Uh, there are people who question the Fed's mandate, question its governance, even question the wisdom and background of its top policymakers, and those are conversations worth having, but that's not the conversation we're having here today. We have an unusually good mix of economists who embrace the Fed's mission, stable prices and maximum sustainable employment, uh, people who have substantial experience as policymakers and scholars who are well positioned to offer reflections and constructive criticisms of the Fed's monetary policy and its framework over the past three years. So that's what we're doing here today. Um, we're honored to have uh, uh, our own Ben Bernanke and Olivier Blanchard from the Peterson Institute across the street, who are going to speak about first about their uh, views on why we had so much more inflation than some people, although not everybody, uh, anticipated. And then we have two discussants, uh, Rich Clarida, who was vice chair of the Fed, and Jason Furman from Harvard, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And then my colleague, Louise Shainer, will join them up here and we'll have a discussion of the questions that are raised or the ones that Louise will make sure that she raises the questions that they ignored uh, in their paper. And then our second paper is by Goiti Egerton of Brown and Don Cohn of Brookings, former vice chair of the Fed, which looks closely at what the Fed's framework changes meant and what its monetary policy tools, particularly forward guidance, uh, uh, how they contributed to the inflation problem we have. And then uh, after that, Ellen Mead, who was involved in the framework, will give some discussion remarks, and then we'll have a panel up here to discuss what questions the Fed should have on its agenda when it, re when it re examines the framework, as it's promised to do in 2025. So we have a very full day. I thank you all for coming. Uh, all the papers and all the slides are posted on our website, and the video will be there as well. So with that, I'd like to call Olivier to the stage to make the initial presentation of the Blanchard Bernanke paper. Perfect. Thank you. So this is indeed a paper with Ben. The Division of Labor is our presenter paper, and Ben will uh, address most of the questions after that. Uh, to direct this to something. Thank you. Good. So let me, let me start with the, the theme of the paper. Uh, go back to the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021 and there, were, there was a large number of very large uh, fiscal packages. So there was the CARES Act in March of 20, then the COVID package by Trump in December, and then 
under the Biden administration, the American Rescue Plan, uh, and this added to, to more than five trillion. This looked very big, and there were two views uh, at the time. Uh, they, they focused uh, on, on the labor market as what the, where the action might, might, uh, might be. There were the optimists, and I think this was the view of the people at the Fed, and they conclu had concluded that the Phillips curve was very flat, so even of a heating would not lead to much inflation, and expectations had become very strongly anchored so that there would not be very large second round effects and so on. There were pessimists, and I would put myself there, I would put Larry Summers there as well, and maybe Jason as well. Uh, the idea was, yeah, I mean, this is how things have been over the last 20 years, but given the size of the shock, the Phillips curve may well steepen very much as you get to very low unemployment, and expectations may well de-anchor if inflation is really taking off. The outcome turned out to be neither. Uh, so there was inflation, so the pessimists were right, but the channel that, uh, for which inflation or demand affected inflation was not so much the labor market, which we had very much focused on, it was the goods market. It's where the action uh, really took place. Commodity prices went up a lot. There were shortages, price spikes, and most of the action came from there. So we got the inflation, but not through the labor market, but through the goods market, which I think is a general uh, lesson to be learned. So what we've experienced in the last uh, three years is headline inflation has been nearly completely dominated by price shocks. One quarter, there's a large change in the energy price. In the next quarter, it's food or price, or, 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 or price spikes and so on. But, and this is what we see, and this is what's discussed every, every month when, when the CPI comes out. But behind the scene, uh, you have had what we think is fairly steady overheating after the COVID uh, period, uh, which have put pressure on wages. And that's very hard to see when the rest moves a lot. But as price shocks tend to fade, and I think the assumption is that they will, then what appears and was not visible before is this higher wage inflation, which is due to another heated labor market and some disanchoring of expectations. So that looking forward, uh, we're going to be dealing with a very different type of inflation in which it's really the labor market again, which becomes the central uh, issue and we will probably have uh, to slow down the economy. That's very much the theme of, of, of the paper. Okay, the approach that, that we have taken has three steps. So the first one is we constructed a really simple analytical model to basically think about the mechanisms for which price shocks or overheating a labor market will affect inflation. <clears throat> so for those of you who have come to Brookings uh, papers meetings uh, for many years, uh, this is very familiar. And basically you can read an old paper by Tobin and it's nearly the same. Uh, it has a wage equation which captures the effect of what happens in the labor market on wages. It has a price equation which reflects what wages are doing and other costs are, uh, are doing. And then it has expectations of inflation. And we think it's important to separate between short-run expectations, what you expect to happen next year, and long-run expectations, uh, which is what you expect, say, in 10 years. So the first thing I'm going to do is basically show you the more quickly and then show you two of the implications, which I think are uh, absolutely central. Then the second part of the paper is we estimate that more on the pre-COVID sample. So we say up to from 1990 to 2019, let's estimate these equations. And we use, we play, which I think is a, is a good game, which is we use the structure of the theoretical model, the analytical model, we just add, allow for more lags because it's clear that the dynamics in, in the real world are more complex, but we don't play around trying different specifications. So I'm fairly convinced about the robustness of what I'm going to say, which is a relevant dimension. And then what we find is that given the state of a, of a labor market, so if I take as given the fact that there has been overheating and that there has been price shocks, then the pre-COVID equations work well. 
it's not as if suddenly the world became completely different. The shocks were different, but the structure, the analytical structure, basically explains very well uh, what has happened. One more conclusion, which I did not expect, is we don't find the anchoring of expectations, or very minor, the anchoring of expectations. I explained what this means. And we were worried about catch-up, which is the notion when then there are price shocks, the real wage tends to decrease. And the question is, how much do the workers try to get back the real wage that they have lost, the real wage loss? And we find very, very little effect of this, which is clearly good news, maybe not for workers, but good for inflation. Now, at the end, this will be the last part, we show the implications of the empirical law, and we show the effect of the different shocks, uh, what happens if there is a price of energy shock, or what happens if the labor market overheats, and then we give you a decomposition of the history of inflation over the last three years, and then we ask very tentatively, because this is not the purpose of a, of a paper, looking forward, suppose the price shocks go away, what can we expect infl inflation to do? And that's that will focus is then again on the state of the labor market and how much more tightening is needed in order to get inflation from 4 to, say, 2%, if this is the target. Okay, so this is the more, and uh, some of you are probably allergic to algebra, but I think I can give you a sense of, of the equations. And if you look at them, they are, they are very simple. Wage inflation depends on expected price inflation, as you try to basically maintain your real wage looking forward. It depends on the state of the labor market. It is variable X. I shall say more about X. You can think of it at this stage as unemployment or a vacancy unemployment ratio. And then there's an additional term, which is the term in the middle in the first equation, which is the catch-up effect, which is that if the price level increased much more than you expected, your real wage has decreased. How much of this are you going to try to get back? When there was indexation in the old days, this would happen more or less automatically, but now there is not. And the question is, do workers try to basically get the real wage that they had before rather than the lower real wage? That's the equation. That's the one we're going to estimate. The other equations are absolutely straightforward. We think of of, of the price. All these are logs, obviously, for those of you who look at the equations. Inflation, price inflation, depends on wage inflation and on the relative price of the non-labor inputs. So if the price of energy goes up relative to the wage, then it leads to a burst of, of inflation. Completely traditional. Uh, we have a variable that I'll talk about, which is that we have clearly commodity prices, such as energy and food, but you know, one of the stories of, of this episode is the shortages and the price spikes. So we have a shortage variable, which would not have been there you know, before 2019. Then we have two, two equations for expectations, which basically say short-run expectations depend on long-run expectations, what you think it's anchored to, and past inflation. So if past inflation is higher, you adjust above. And then the long-run expectation is again the same. It depends on itself lagged. And if you see that inflation has been higher, you may adjust your long-run expectation a little bit. We would expect the effect to be small, but not, not zero. Okay, so let me give you two slides which show simulations of them all, which are, are going to be very important in thinking about what happens in the data. So this is the effect of a one-time permanent increase, say, in the price of energy. So it's high energy inflation growth for one quarter, right? It's a change in the level, and therefore in the growth rate, it's a one-time increase in the growth rate of the price. And initially, clearly, this increases prices, so it increases inflation. Okay. But then what happens over time depends on two characteristics of the economy and of the model. The first one is how much do expectations adjust relative to this? When people see high inflation, how does this change the way they think about coming inflation? And catch-up, which is that if there has been a shock like this, how much of it do they want? And I give you two uh, loci. The first one, the blue one, is expectations don't react very much and catch up is weak. So the effect goes away nearly right away. You see it in the quarter in which it happens, but after this it's nearly gone. Not completely gone, 
can see that you don't quite go to zero because expectations have moved a little bit. The red line is kind of a bad case. Catch up is strong, expectations react strongly, so you get strong second round effects. And because this affects expectations, you end up with high inflation uh, in the long run. So keep this in mind, and you'll see the data in a while and compare. This is the effect of permanent tightening of uh, labor market. So again, think of X as low unemployment or high vacancy unemployment ratio. And there again, you're going to get the direct effect, which is if the labor market is very tight, you're going to get pressure on wages, which is going to lead to pressure on prices. That's the standard textbook. Uh, but it's, it can be strong or it can be weak. Uh, as long as X is too high relative to its normal value, so as long as unemployment is below U star, to use the usual jargon, then there's going to be pressure on inflation. So in that case, inflation keeps increasing. But the way it increases depends, again, very much on the dynamics of expectations. If expectations react very much, you get inflation to increase faster and faster. This is really the accelerationist hypothesis of the old days, and that's the brown line. Uh, but if expectations are quiet, you get some increase in inflation, but it's less, and you can see that's the blue line here. Good. So this was part one. Now we go to the data, and let me just say a few things about what we do. So we estimate the four equations exactly as we, you've seen them. So not all the variables are not in all the equations, only the variables which were implied by the model. We allow for, you use quarterly data. Um, we allow for four lags of all the included variables. We don't play with lags at all. So it, it's a bit in the space of a VAR, but with zeros, where we think that some variables don't belong. The identification, if you want to think in terms of a VAR, is that the main assumption is we assume that wage inflation during one quarter does not respond to anything within the quarter. So this allows us to basically get an identified system. The sample, we didn't want to go back to 1980 or 1970 because things were different. We started 1990 where inflation is relatively stable. And so the sample is 1990 to 2019. There is one equation where we cannot do what I said, which is stop in 2019, because in the price equation, shortages play a big role. There was no shortage, basically, before that. So if you only use the pre-2019 sample, you don't see anything. So for the price equation, we use the full sample. Um, of the variables, let me not you know, go through them. We do a lot of robustness. For example, we do it with a CPI. We do it with a PCE for the price. Uh, on expectations, we use the Cleveland Fed or the survey of, of professional forecasters. The f two things I want to mention is this shortage variable. So we know that there were a number of markets where, you know, you couldn't get the goods. And in the paper, we have a discussion of the automobile sector where we, we can really tell the story in detail. The question is how to capture this. We found uh, that the variable shortage, when you go to Google Trends, works marvelously in the sense that there are two quarters in the history of the last three years where without it you get a large forecast error. And if you basically these are the two quarters where people went to the net and said shortage, shortage. And so we use that variable uh, and it beats actually many of the variables which have been proposed uh, that that's the variable we use. Um, footnote, it actually has come down from the peaks it is very far from zero. And so it's, it indicates that people are still worried about shortages. And the other, good, and, and the other uh, viable for the labor market, and there's a long discussion in the paper, which I will not go back to, is instead of using unemployment, we use a vacancy unemployment ratio. And that's something that I've argued for in a long time with Peter Diamond, but until now, the two variables varied more, highly correlated. You couldn't tell. But in this crisis, they have separated. This is what's known as the shift in the beverage curve. And we think that V over U is the right variable. OK. So let me now move very quickly. So what this shows is basically the results of 
the uh, regressions. And given the time, I'm just going to ask you to look at the visuals. So what this does, for example, for the wage equation, it uses the estimated equation up to 2019, and then use this to predict what has happened since using the actual values of uh, V over U and so on, right? So as you can see for the wage, it kind of works, and if we had time, I would talk about the coefficients, but I don't. For the price equation, now again, that's more in sample than extrapolation, but you can see that it works amazingly well. Uh, by the standards of, of that type of exercise. And then, okay, so let me now take an issue which is very important, which is, as, you, as, as I've argued, headline inflation is completely dominated by the price of energy, the price of food, and shortages. Now, where do these come from is a big issue. And there are two stories. One is, well, it just happened coincidentally or the other, which I tend to believe, is that it came largely from aggregate demand. Just it didn't go through the usual channel, but it basically put pressure on commodity prices and so on. So what we did, and I think that's an important part of the exercise, we said let's look at commodity markets in general. So let's take all the uh, commodity prices that we can put our hands on. It's reasonable, I think, to think that on the demand side, there's a common element, which is that if there's higher demand, there's higher demand for all commodities. On the supply side, it is more likely that the supply shocks in each market are more idiosyncratic. You know, there's a mine for lithium which is opened, or there's a problem with copper. So if you assume that, then the common element of all this series is something like aggregate demand. And so that's what we do. We do a principal component, <coughs> and what you get is this. Uh, the red line is, the, sorry, the blue line is the principal component, and the red line is in the top the price of energy, and in the bottom the price of food. And you can see that until the Ukraine episode, uh, the blue and the red line are very similar. So my sense is much of the price movement comes from uh, from from aggregate demand. So aggregate demand in the end didn't work so much for the labour market, but it works for the goods market. Let me keep going. These are the regressions for expectations. And again, very good fit. I think what's important here is that, yes, both short-run and long-run expectations respond to actual inflation, but the coefficients are very small. So let me move. I'm going to redo the two exercises that I showed you in the theoretical model. So this is the impulse responses of inflation to one standard deviation in one of the price shocks. So one time increase in the price of energy. And the point I want to make, I've reproduced the theoretical one on the top, is basically that they don't last. So this idea, basically there hasn't been second round effects. There are these big shocks every quarter, but they more or less disappear in terms of their effect on inflation the next quarter. It could have been different, and maybe it's different in Europe, for example, but that's what we find. By contrast, if you sustain too high a vacancy unemployment ratio, then you get you know, something which doesn't go away and builds up. And so again, you have a very high frequency shocks and the thing behind. So when we go to more slides, so this is a decomposition of price inflation uh, since uh, the first quarter of 2020. Look at the colors, and basically what seems to dominate, as you can see, is blue and yellow, right? And blue and yellow are basically the price shocks. It's price of energy, it's price of food, it's shortages. And you can see from quarter to quarter, that's most of the action, right? What you see also is the small red part. The small red part is the result of overheating in the labor market. And it's not big, right? The trade effect just for the labor market is small. And the question is, when the price shocks go away, then basically the yellow and the blue will disappear, and you'll be stuck with the red, which doesn't look very big, but may actually be fairly hard uh, to get rid of. Now, this is the same for wages. Now, you can see that for wages, what dominates is V over U, much more. The effect of uh, price shocks is only for their effect on expectations. They don't affect wages directly. Okay. 
last slide and then a conclusion slide. I hope I'm still more or less on time. Okay, so we did something that we were very reluctant to do because we know that journalists in the room are going to look at this thing uh, much too closely. We decided that we could not stop and not think about, okay, what happens if? So these are conditional projections, but there are in no way specific forecasts. Remember, the model is estimated up to 2019. It hasn't been optimized to have the best forecast. Price shocks may not be zero. So now that I've made all the caveats, I can talk about what happens here, because I think that's the important part. So what this does is it looks at eight, uh, three different paths in which we do something to the other U. So the first one, the brown one, is we keep it at the current value, which is 1.8, right? which we think is overheating. Right? The second one, we get it down over eight quarters to 1.2, which we think is probably close to the natural vacancy unemployment rate. And then the green one, we take it down in eight quarters, 2.8, which is slightly depressed. Uh, labor market in that sense. And the conclusion is that it may take quite a bit of a decrease in the other U uh, to actually achieve anything close to a 2% target two years from now. And, you know, we don't want to push this too much, but again, now the Phillips curve is very flat. And therefore, what we have to give, what we have to remove may require quite a bit of, uh, uh, of contraction. So let me finish with four conclusions. The first one is, you know, there's been a lot of articles in the press about the fact that the Phillips curve has died, we have to rethink macro, macroeconomists know nothing, and so on and so on. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it looks like, you know, what we showed you is a fairly standard model, and we applied it to the data, and it worked. Now, I think it, you really have to think in terms of both wages and prices. I think the reduced form price approach that many take is not right. There is really action in both. Good. Okay. The, the second is the obvious one, which is the complexity of the shocks. And we didn't predict them. We didn't think that commodity prices would increase as much. It took us a while to understand the effect of shortages on price spikes and so on. I think looking forward to more episodes in the future, we have to be much more open to the fact that there is more action, potentially more action in the goods market. Uh, the Third point, and here I'm going to repeat things I've said along the way, the price shocks in the goods market really have dominated the high-frequency discussion. Uh, but this is that they haven't had dyna strong dynamic effects. And I think there we have to give credit to the Fed for credibility, which is that expectations react to inflation, but they didn't react to inflation more in this episode than they have in the last 20 years. So credibility is there. And then the last one, which I also mentioned, but let me repeat it, is overheating in the labor market. For until basically recently was a minor factor in inflation, right? But now that the rest is gone, this is what dominates. And this is where it's going to be hard uh, to adjust. One last remark, there is a whole other discussion which is, okay, so we have to decrease the other U. What does this imply for U? Because U is the variable that, you know, people think about. And that's a discussion that has happened between Nye Summers and I on one side and Alex Domash, and on the other side, Chris Waller. And it's a question about what has happened to the beverage curve, whether it has shifted, which is a shift in the relation between U and VU. If it has shifted and it remains shifted, what we say is bad news for unemployment. If Chris Waller is right, and there was a shift, and the shift is going to be completely undone, then we need slightly higher unemployment, but it's not crazy, maybe 1% rather than some larger numbers. At this stage, I will be honest, Chris Waller is doing better than the Blanchard Summers team. But we shall see. I hope very much he's right for the welfare of the unemployed. But uh, we'll see. Thank you very much. Great. Um, well, this is a wonderful paper. It's incredibly elegant. It shows how much you can do with a model 
um, that I can understand. It uses models, estimation, et cetera, that harken back to a number of papers I'd read um, from Ben and Olivier's back in as early as graduate school. I'm largely in agreement um, with the conclusion and the path forward. If I had 20 minutes for my comments, I would continue on for 10 more um, with my praise, but I only have 10 minutes um, for my comments and want to describe some of the ways in which I think the paper doesn't settle one of the biggest debates and how I would interpret um, some aspects of it differently than they do. And I think the issue is that the exogenous shocks in the model, food, energy, shortages, as the authors well understand, productivity as well, are all endogenous. And so you're really looking at changes in endogenous things and that none of them map exactly um, to what happened um, in terms of policy. I think the fundamental debate between the optimists and the pessimists wasn't the slope of the Phillips curve and would you get inflation through the labor market, but it was a broader debate. On the one side was the series of unfortunate events view um, that basically the model was correct, but the inflation happened because who could have forecast a whole set of unfortunate events? Now, those unfortunate events started out with the vaccines being effective, which in the first half of 2021 was the reason for inflation. In the second half of 2021, the unfortunate event was the vaccines were ineffective, which also caused higher inflation, the microchip shortages, the portage clog, the Russian invasion, um, et cetera. These were all things no forecaster could have known about their exogenous um, shocks. On the other side is the original sin view um, that all of this was due to fiscal and monetary policy. And fiscal and monetary policy don't just need to operate through the labor market. They can operate through a number of these other channels as well, like um, shortages. Broadly, my own guess coming into this paper and my own view coming out of this paper is that an orange line core PCE inflation has been about 5% annual rate, that most of that was original sin. It was predictable. You just couldn't think the whole inflation was going to operate through the labor market. There would be other channels for demand. And that most of the excess of headline over core was an unfortunate accident which was the Russian invasion of Ukraine, with very little of that bleeding into core. So let me take that second part first. I'm going to talk about core inflation and the limited food energy pass-through, where the shortage is due to the Peloton economy, um, and then talk about an alternative way of thinking about things. Um, uh, Olivier showed you this decomposition, and you see in the dark blue... And the light blue, you get the food um, and energy, and this is for overall inflation. There's something really striking about this finding that they don't draw out in their paper, which is that these contributions from their model, the food and energy contributions, are exactly the same as the BLS contribution of food and energy to overall inflation, almost exactly the same. So these are two pairs of bars. The left bar is their shock, and it's how much food and energy contribute to overall inflation based on the model. And then on the right-hand side is just literally mechanically, if food went up 10% and it's 10% of uh, overall inflation, it adds one percentage point to inflation. That's what the BLS publishes every month. And the sum of them are those diamonds. The dark diamond is what they estimate, the hollow one, um, is what the BLS does. The fact that those are basically the same is consistent with there being essentially zero pass-through from food and energy to core, not just uh, to, to core, not just um, with a lag, but contemporaneously as well. I think that's quite important because there's been a lot of discussion um, about the pass-through. I think that's broadly consistent with a lot of research, by the way, that says when gasoline prices go up, um, airfares go up, but people can't afford to buy as much. Other things go down. And some previous papers have even found small negative pass-through um, from oil price increases to core. So they don't um, look at core in their paper. This is sort of rough. It's not going to be exactly right. It has a residual um, for some of the error, but it looks at the excess of inflation. Inflation, CPI above 2.3, which is the Fed's target uh, give or take, measured in that space. Um, and you see 
um, shortages play a really big role in 2021, a sizable role in 2022, and some role in 2023. Um, I don't have time to talk about it, but initial conditions is in productivity. I'm quite worried that that's endogenous and not um, telling us something external, but that's a discussion for another time. Um, let's look harder at shortages. The shortage story generally has two pieces. One is a set of supply chain problems made it harder to produce things, largely around microchips, sometimes around ports. I'm not going to talk very much about that. I think that's been pretty dramatically overstated. For example, port capacity in 2021 was 18% above what it was in 2019. That was a huge increase in what ports were processing. It just wasn't as huge as all the stuff Americans wanted to buy from abroad. Um, what I want to do, though, is talk about the consumer side, which the paper talks about in interpreting its shortage shock and give you an alternative interpretation. Um, the Peloton economy thesis, not their term. I'm not sure who first came up with it. I've heard both Justin Wolfers and Paul Krugman use it. Um, is that COVID caused people to shift spending from services to goods and that this rotation was inflationary because the supply of goods is more inelastic. I'm really deeply unsure about the first part of this argument, um, and I'm somewhat unsure about the second, too. So let's look at consumption spending on sporting goods um, and gyms. This is recreational goods, vehicles, sporting equipment, supplies, guns, and ammunition. You can't break it down any finer than that. And you do see a big increase in spending on this. But note, the big increases are when people get their checks. And those increases are happening in the first half of 2021, as the economy is reopening, COVID is coming down, people are going back. What were people doing on the services side over the same period of time? This is spending on membership clubs and participant sports centers. Those were rising quite sharply too. And so what we saw in 2021 looks a lot less like COVID is keeping people home so they have to order Pelotons rather than pay gym memberships and looks a lot more like people are flush with cash. The economy is reopening. They're spending a bunch of that cash on durable goods and a bunch on non-durables. And in fact, the 2008 stimulus checks, Jonathan Parker's research finds, the majority of that money was spent on durables. You give people a large lump sum, what do they do? They try to buy a used car. Um, you see similar things in um, you know, personal care services and personal care products um, and overall. Um, moreover, the idea that the U.S. spending on goods and rotation from goods to services was exogenously caused by COVID is belied by a comparison to other G7 economies. This is real durable goods expenditures. In the United States, they just go up enormously. They go up 10% in the first half of 2021. Everywhere else, they were flat, or in Germany, they even went down um, quite a lot. And what's notable is most of those other economies uh, were much slower to reopen. They had higher COVID, slower vaccination, more rules that prevented people from consuming services. So if anything, the exogenous, it's COVID that led to the goods, as opposed to you give people a lot of money, and what do they spend money on? They spend it on goods. Um, that should apply even more to the other economies there. So I think the shortages, at least on the demand side, really were a predictable consequence of the cash, not um, the COVID. The second part, and frankly, I'm less sure about this, and it actually doesn't matter um, to my overall argument, is the authors, in interpreting the shortage term, have a model like this, which is durable goods goes up. Because people are spending more on durables, they can't afford to buy as many services, and so services demand shifts back. But because you have this nonlinearity, you get inflation from one, higher prices on the goods side. You don't get lower prices on, on the services side. I think that's not necessarily um, where we were. I think where we were might have looked more like this, where services demand would have increased a lot. But because goods were so expensive because of the shortages and the like, services demand only increased a little. The service sector also had huge numbers of job openings, huge amounts of, there wasn't a lot of elasticity when I went out to restaurants in terms of how many people they could serve and the like, and so you were on the vertical part 
of the supply curve in the service sector, too. And so that rotation, as people spent more on goods, less on services, uh, may not have mattered. So let me talk about what I think the pessimists thought um, from the beginning, which, based on this overly polemical, unfair linear policy analysis, give every household a million dollars. It's 514% of GDP in fiscal stimulus. The multiplier is 0.8, so GDP goes up 412%. The unemployment rate falls to zero. Phillips curve has a slope of 0.15. Inflation rises to 2.6. To be clear, this is not their model. Their model has V over U, so it has a nonlinearity. But I think this was the type of model that people were operating with. Then when we saw real GDP growth only a little above uh, baseline and massive inflation, you come along and run your regression, and lo and behold, what do you find? The model was completely right. It was the right way to think about it, Um, but there was a shortage shock because there's shortages everywhere um, throughout the economy. And so I think, and this title of the slide is unfair. Um, Olivier convinced me of that, so I'm going to change it later, that in the labor market, they're doing monetary fiscal to real GDP, to the labor market. The first steps are happening in the background, and that to inflation through the Phillips curve. I think a better way to capture the concern the pessimists had, the original sin view, was that if you get a lot of nominal GDP and you can't make a lot of real GDP, what are you going to get? You're going to get things through the labor market. You're going to get shortages. You're going to get higher food prices. You're going to get higher energy prices, um, et cetera. And broadly, when you look at the experience, real GDP did quite well. You don't see a lot of supply shocks in real GDP. The fact that it got back to the pre-crisis forecast by the end of 2021 is amazing. million premature deaths, people out of the labor force, less immigration, all the disruption, COVID still with us, Omicron hitting, and you're back um, there. So in some sense, the real economy did incredibly well. It's just so much money was pumped into it. Nominal GDP went up a lot, and that showed up in all the different error terms in their model um, in terms of inflation being well above um, what was forecast. So in summary and conclusion, I think it's a really elegant paper. I think it's a very good way to think about inflation in normal times. I think it doesn't answer the series of unfortunate events versus original sin question. Um, I think it finds that um, food and energy do not explain any of core inflation, and I agree with that finding. The shortages are just as consistent with demand increases. I think that's a more compelling interpretation of them than anything caused by COVID or caused by supply. Um, I think for large shocks, you almost want to ignore the labor market. You know the inflation will show up somewhere, even if you don't know quite where and how. Um, And regardless, I do agree with the authors um, about what I think their conclusion is, the improbability of a soft landing at 2.0% inflation. Thank you. Okay, get the uh, get the slides up. Yeah, you can just click next. Oh, just click it. Okay, let's see if I can figure this out. Perfect. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this conference. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. In my 12 minutes, I'm going to do three things. First because I think this is going to be primarily a U.S.-focused discussion. I want to broaden the discussion to include some uh, contact, global context for uh, inflation and the policy response. Uh, Second, I will talk briefly about doing what I think of as as rigorous counterfactuals to to Fed liftoff. And then thirdly, we'll actually discuss the paper, in part piggybacking off the fact that I knew Jason would do a, a good job. So the first thing to emphasize, which you all know, but it oftentimes gets forgotten in discussions of Fed policy, is that a persistent sustained surge in core price inflation is a distinctive and distressing reality of the post-pandemic global uh, economy. It could be a coincidence. Uh, I don't think so. So as an economist, one is encouraged to look for common uh, uh, factors. Well, one common factor is clearly a decline in post-pandemic aggregate supply consistent with a 2% uh, inflation uh, target. The left chart is from a recent excellent speech by Catherine Mann. The right chart is from a paper that John Williams previewed uh, or premiered last week at a Fed 
uh, uh, conference. And so if you go back to Econ 101 or Act 10 at, at Harvard, there's aggregate supply and aggregate demand, um, and aggregate supply is clearly uh, an issue in terms of thinking about uh, uh, the level of demand consistent with a price inflation uh, target. Secondly, and this will get to Jason's point, there was a substantial fiscal and monetary policy uh, support uh, delivered uh, and during the first year of the pandemic in support of aggregate uh, demand. And this is true whether or not you look at the fiscal policy response, whether or not you look at, in the case of the Fed, cutting rates to zero, offering forward guidance, or whether or not you look at balance sheet uh, expansion. So uh, I think there's actually more variation across countries in fiscal response than a monetary uh, policy. Um, every central bank, at least I'm talking about advanced economies, did some version of cutting rates to zero or to the effective lower bound if they could, doing substantial quantitative easing uh, and offering some form of forward uh, guidance. So obviously ex post, this turned out to be too accommodative relative to post-pandemic aggregate supply, getting back to Jason's uh, comments, but according to observers, critics, were ex ante too accommodative, even relative to a pre-pandemic arrogant supply assumption. Um, what I would point out is that in June of 2021, the Fed's SEP projections projected that in 2021, GDP growth would be at 7%. It came in at 5.7, and this was not due to insufficient uh, uh, demand. Now, correlations are not causation. Again, another thing we learned in EC10, uh, but if one wants to look for correlations in the data, there's much more of a correlation between cross-country fiscal uh, intervention and cross-country inflation than there is between cross-country growth in the monetary base uh, and um, um, uh, inflation. Um, and so I think that, at least to me, is worth thinking about as well. Again, expanding the domain of inquiry away from the Fed to what can we learn. We have an unusual situation where we have a truly exogenous shock, which is a, a pandemic, uh, we shut down the global economy or chunks of the global economy. We also then had a reopening shock, which in itself was a shock given supply chains. And then we had an endogenous policy response uh, to the first and uh, uh, the second. And so I think taking advantage of cross-country analysis at some point will be the preferred approach to thinking about this period as opposed to country-by-country by country, uh, analysis. Another common factor is a large and persistent change in sectoral relative uh, prices, uh, goods versus uh, services. Here, I'm not taking a stand on demand versus supply. If you just go to a basic uh, equation for a price index, it's going to be some log linear average of services and goods prices. If the relative price of goods goes up for whatever reason, if the equilibrium price of goods goes up for whatever reason, then the overall price level will go up unless the central bank wants to engineer a decline in services prices. So in a sort of a standard uh, model, if there's some nominal rigidity in the service sector, if there's an equilibrium increase in relative prices, the central bank has a choice. You either allow the relative price to go through and take a one-time increase in the price level, or you raise rates and throw people out of work to, to reduce the price of, of services. And most central banks... Uh, went for the accommodation, at least initially, to relative price changes. Now, there's a saying that facts are stubborn things, and here are some facts about advanced economy post-pandemic inflation and central bank policy response. Number one, inflation in advanced economies is well above inflation targets now entering the third year of the reopening. Number two, core inflation in advanced economies is well above inflation targets now three years into the reopening, with the exception of Switzerland. I'll get to Switzerland in a minute. No advanced economy central bank began to hike rates until inflation exceeded target. Almost all advanced economy central banks delayed rate hikes until core inflation exceeded target. So here's the list. Obviously, in the U.S., in Canada, core inflation was 4.4 at the time of the first rate hike. In New Zealand, 2.7. In the Eurozone, 3.7. Uh, in the U.K., 4. And in Sweden, 4.1. Um, so all these central banks at some level found themselves, and clearly, given the choice of policy, uh, chose to fall behind the, uh, chose to fall behind the curve. Um, why this happened, obviously, is a, a very important and interesting question, but it says more about the practice of inflation targeting central banking in this period than it does about 
any particular implementation of a framework. There's a nice recent paper by Beaudry and co-authors looking at an analysis of why inflation targeting central banks delayed liftoff until core inflation exceeded uh, target. Um, and so if the documented inflation overshoots and the choices to fall behind the curve represent framework failure in this episode, they represent, at least in this episode, failures of both IT um, and its first cost and flexi flexible average inflation targeting. I don't think this is the case. I believe these ex post errors were errors of tactics, not of strategy, tactical judgments in the fog of war, uh, and I'll get back to that more in a moment. Okay, now a little bit on the Fed. I can do this in five minutes, thank you. We all know that the Fed began to lift off in March of 2022, and given the inflation overshoot and persistence, one is encouraged to think about uh, counterfactual uh, liftoffs for the Fed. You know, counterfactuals are both too easy and too hard. Uh, so to put some discipline on this process, I'll look at two plausible counterfactuals. Uh, one is that the Fed had just lifted off according to a standard Taylor-type uh, rule. Remember, in a Taylor rule, if inflation's above target, you want to raise rates, but if unemployment's above your estimate of full employment, you want to depress rates. And in the case of the Fed, you really don't get a liftoff under the balanced approach rule until the September 2021 uh, Fed uh, meeting. Now, this is a static rule. Uh, you know, a central bank that had a good crystal ball uh, and who saw the inflation obviously could have hiked. But just on a static Taylor rule, you would have gotten liftoff in September. At the earlier table I showed you, the average gap between when core inflation moved above two and when the central bank began to hike is about six months. And so that would also put it in roughly September of 2021. Interestingly enough, the uh, threshold forward guidance that the Fed put forward in September of 2020 to lift off, namely that inflation's at target and, and the labor market is in the committee's judgment at full employment, those conditions were met by December of 2021. So three months after uh, the conditions for a standard uh, Taylor uh, rule. Uh, and this just documents that those conditions were met by December of 2021. So a couple of things before I actually get to the discussing uh, the paper. First is what's striking in these charts for, for Dallas Fed trim means, so underlying inflation uh, and the labor market, is they both go hockey stick at exactly the same time, which is the third quarter of 2021. So up to that point, if you came into the year with a prior that there was slack in the economy, both through the labor market and, and aggregate supply, there was nothing to really change you of that view until, obviously, things went hockey stick. And in particular, at the point that broad-based price inflation picked up in the U.S., the level of GDP was still two percentage points below then estimates of potential. And, of course, in the labor market, the unemployment rate was no north of uh, five, and participation was below. The one indicator, and again, we saw this in Olivier's uh, uh, paper in his work, the one indicator that was back to pre-pandemic levels was the vacancy unemployment ratio by, by the fall of 2021. So finally, some thoughts on the paper uh, itself. Uh, as, as Jason pointed out, most of the inflation overshoot in 21 and early 22 was attrib is attributed to food, energy, shortages, and the residual. Maybe piggybacking a little bit off Jason's uh, comments, is the residual picking up excess demand not captured by VU uh, and some other uh, variables? In particular, VU and theoretical models can reflect both supply and uh, uh, demand. So fast forward to today, the residual is now small, and if you squint at the last bar in Q1 2023, it looks like in this model what I would call underlying inflation uh, is around 4%, and that actually comports with other models that I look at. Statistical models of underlying inflation are all somewhere in the mid to high threes uh, right now. Uh, in terms of specification, I was reassured by the finding uh, that during this period, inflation expectations remained uh, well uh, anchored. Uh, that certainly is a policy success compared to the 1970s. Um, one thing that's interesting about looking at long-run inflation expectations data um, is in the last 10 years or so, it's pretty mean reverting, whether or not you look at Michigan surveys or, or other indicators, it's pretty mean reverting around a particular level. So given that they don't find a lot of pass-through into long-run inflation expectations, a version of the model that essentially, um, essentially uh, re reflects that could be an interesting alternative uh, calculation. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the uh, discussion.
Okay, um, before you speak, everybody just as a reminder to hit the, the little button here that looks like a microphone. So um, first of all, thank you very much for the incredibly clear um, presentation and clear, really wonderful discussion remarks. I thought those were fantastic. I'm gonna basically give you a chance to respond, Ben, um, to the discussants, but let's just, just, let's just start with the big question, which is you know, what, how do you view this question about what your paper does or doesn't say about the um, effective fiscal policy on inflation? So let me f <clears throat> first thank the discussants. Uh, Jason is my go-to guy for inflation information, both uh, at uh, Peterson and on Twitter. Um, and Rich, of course, was in the room, you know, when it was decisions were made, as Hamilton tells us. So um, I really value their views. I think that I'll, I'll respond mostly to Jason since he spent the most time on our paper. Um, uh, he sets up the the um, debate as being sort of fiscal monetary aggregate demand versus, you know, supply constraints. And that's not at all what we were trying to do. We think that aggregate demand was an important part of the story. What we did say is that the aggregate demand working through the labor market because of the Phillips curve is flat and because the output gaps were not that big, um, did not have a large effect on wages in the short term. That's, that's, that's the uh, contrarian thing that we say. But we also talk explicitly about the effects of aggregate demand on commodity prices. We do this exercise with, with the principal component. Um, and also the effects on uh, the demand for uh, goods like cars that were in short supply. So uh, I just reject that. And we, we do look at aggregate demand, uh, albeit we don't uh, develop all of the linkages. Um, by the way, to, to ignore the supply constraints, I, um, we, we actually did research by calling GM and talking to the economists there. If you look at our figure six, you'll see that at the same time that prices were rising sharply in the auto industry and inventories were collapsing, production was going down. I mean, if it was a, if it was a demand side thing, you think production would at least stay the same or it'll go up a little bit. Um, so I, I do believe that there was a supply side constraint. What we were trying to do, I should say, was not to play AD against AS. What we were trying to do is show that um, these different sources of inflation, and there were multiple sources of inflation, interact with each other. For example, higher uh, gas prices coming from higher oil prices in turn might affect uh, people's inflation expectations, which in turn might affect the wages that they ask their employers for, which in turn might affect the prices that the employers charge. And despite the comment about core inflation, I think if you look at it, I think you know we do find that uh, energy and food prices did have a bigger effect in their share of, uh, of the basket, uh, both because uh, they have some longer term effects on other goods and services, but because of these indirect effects going on. Um, Jason gave a political, polemical example of a million dollars a person. Um, just for his future research, and this is a neutral comment, he, he ought to try a, a real example, World War II, uh, where both the supply and the demand of consumer goods went up tremendously. I mean, I'm sorry, the demand for consumer goods went up tremendously. Supply went down because uh, the government was converting uh, factories to, to war production, uh, rationing and so on kept prices under control. But I mean, think there's some, there's some good uh, case studies to look at that aren't quite so hypothetical. Um, the last thing I want to say, and this has puzzled me, and I've been following Jason's work for a long time, is this argument that the fact that nominal GDP went up while real output stayed the same is somehow proof that fiscal policy was important. I, I just don't see it. I'd like to see the model. I'd like to see the estimates. There's nothing, think about your Econ 101 book, and I know that Jason teaches that <laughs> at Harvard. Uh, if the AD curve and the AS curve are both moving up at the same pace, you get constant output and rising prices. There's no, there's no reason why that can't be true. In fact, uh, 
there's a paper, a nice paper by uh, Godard Leone and Gertler that came out that argues that the main sources of the inflation were on the supply side, but the Fed was accommodating that so as to avoid a recession, and therefore you were getting big inflation without you know, a recession. So I guess my argument is just that you know, while it is a tautology that if output growth is constant and inflation is high, that nominal GDP will be high, uh, I, don't see, I just don't see why that uh, says anything about the source of the inflation. Thank you. Thanks. You want to respond? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, let me just respond to three of those points. First of all, if I said that your paper implied it was supply and I was disagreeing with your paper and saying it was demand, um, that's my fault for speaking unclearly. I think the paper is agnostic on whether shortages, food, and energy are supply or demand. I think, unfortunately, the big question a lot of people had was, were those changes completely predictable? So if you did this fiscal and monetary policy, you were inevitably going to get shortages, so you should have been able to predict the inflation. Or was it like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I certainly would not fault any forecaster at the Fed for not having incorporated um, in their 2021 uh, model? So my claim is that your paper just doesn't answer that question. I was then supplying the interpretation that I think of the shortage term as probably telling us more about demand than supply, and also the shortage term not being like a random unpredictable shock like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but something that should have been fully expected, especially in a world where you would expect people to buy a lot of durables with um, one-time checks. I uh, agree with your discussion of cars. I think that is the one example where there w and it's a quite big and important one because it's a big part of durable goods, where there was a supply problem. Um, almost every other durable sector, though, um, does not look like cars. Um, even for cars, part of the supply problem was that microchips were being diverted and produced for other consumer electronics rather than from cars. So itself, um, the lower production was a function of demand elsewhere. And moreover, there's the general equilibrium point that if you have to spend more on a car, you can't spend as much on a restaurant. And then it matters a lot whether that doesn't affect inflation because you're on the elastic part of the curve, or it does because you're on the inelastic. So the first one, just to sort of summarize that, I'm not disagreeing with your paper. I am interpreting your paper differently than I think some of the initial interpretations I have seen. On the second point of World War II, I think World War II was the reason why I thought there might not be um, inf the sort of best argument for there not being inflation would be that the World War II experience was continued. What was interesting about World War II was output when, I can't remember the numbers, four or five percent real GDP above its previous uh, trend, just a dramatic increase. A lot of things went into that, like wage price controls, directed production, um, and the like. Um, if you looked at the summary of economic projections that Rich showed us with, what, 7% GDP growth or whatever it was in 2021, those were, projections were remarkable. They had GDP growth at the end of 2021 being higher than the pre-pandemic forecast that the Fed made, even though their forecast for the unemployment rate was lower than their pre-pandemic forecast. So how are they predicting higher output with lower unemployment? They had a huge burst of productivity. That is what you saw in World War II. I think some of that productivity is endogenous. And I think if we had had that huge burst in productivity, um, it would have absorbed the demand and we wouldn't have gotten the inflation. The fact that we got normal productivity, not actually not normal, it was above normal in 2021, um, but not way above normal, I think, was at the root of the forecasting errors, if you go into the models. Um, and finally, on the nominal and real GDP, in some ways I said it already, but you, know, you do 10.5% of GDP, you do 10% of GDP in fiscal stimulus for two straight years, that money has to go somewhere. And if it can't, you know, if real output is going up sort of as much as it can, prices are the things that can adjust in an unlimited way real output faces a set of real constraints. And the fact that those real constraints didn't look like World War II, um, I think, was 
you know, maybe a little bit surprising ex post, but probably a reasonable thing to have expected ex ante. Olivia. I think there's an interesting question about whether we should have predicted the increase in commodity prices in 2021. And I think it's fair to say that nobody did. Retrospectively, clearly it was due to aggregate demand, it seems to me, a good part of it. And we should probably have anticipated it. But I think somebody should look more closely because after all, US is not the world. Commodity prices are traded on a world basis. Was the US fiscal expansion sufficient to explain the increase in commodity prices? Sorry. Was the US, suppose we want to, 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 to blame the US fiscal expansion for the increase in commodity prices, then we have to convince ourselves that the US is big enough that it explains the increase because the other countries did not have the same kind of fiscal expansion. Uh, the other is just a side remark. We basically have swept the issue of productivity growth under the rug, and we have not focused on it. And productivity growth has moved enormously during the period, going up and then down and then uh, still down at this point. And I think that's probably more part of the story than, than we have emphasized, and there should be more work on it. Olivia, can I ask you a question? You said maybe you should have been able to predict the commodity prices. Do you think the shortages, if somebody did this type of policy again, would you predict shortages outside of a COVID setting? So, so yes, we first, so I, you know, I've learned my lessons, right? Uh, so next time it happens, I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> uh, it seems to me that I'll think hard about the effect on commodity prices and whether the increase in demand is sufficient. And I will think hard about how likely we are to get to the point where the supply curve in particular sectors becomes vertical. I think most of the previous uh, cyclical fluctuations were such that firms were operating on the horizontal part. So even if output was a bit higher than they would have liked, they could still do it. I think what happened here is that the vertical part in some segments just shifted back and the shock in demand was so large that this time we actually got a lot of outcomes on the vertical part. So I think if we get again a big demand push and indications that the supply side uh, may not be very elastic in some sectors, I will worry ex ante as opposed to exposed. Can I ask a question about this catch up, this lack of catch up? And so there's a little bit, the sort of looking forward, I think there's a debate among people who say, we, you know, the Fed has to look at wages because that's what's going to be determining inflation. And others who pe people say, look, the real wage is still lower, there has to be catch up at some point. And therefore, it's so you can imagine that markets will come down as wages go up. So maybe the, the wages will react later. Has this changed your view of that? Or how do you think about that? And is it surprising that there's no catch up? Does that mean that the real wage is sort of forever lower because of this episode? Well, not necessarily forever, but there's a, there's a distinction between catch-up, which is making up uh, unexpected inflation in the past, mm -hmm. and which, if there, was, if there were strong catch-up, I'd think of that as a price-wage spiral, in a sense. You know, inflation goes up unexpectedly, and so workers want to get compensated for that, and that feeds into prices, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't get that. We don't find the catch-up effect. So, um, in, at least in the short run, real wages do go down, as they have, empirically. Um, over time, as labor markets tighten, for example, the, you know, the, um, they still can eventually uh, uh, catch up. Um, what was the other part? Well, so if you think that what happened was there was a high demand, prices went up pushing up markups, yeah. then is it possible that wages can go up without it then being reflected further into, and the response is a decline in markups. That's, I think, one view of, of, of what, what could happen, right? So wages can go up, but you don't necessarily get inflation because basically it's just coming out of sort of high profits. Well, I, it's certainly possible. We always, in, in the Fed, the FOMC, we would talk about where markups were and how much space there was for wages to adjust. You, you're nodding. You know you were at those meetings. Um, I think it de depends. What we're, we're saying is that supply and demand conditions uh, in product markets are important and uh, the, the markups, not all of them perhaps, but at least some of them depend on uh, 
you know, demand and supply in a particular uh, product market. Did you want to get? Yeah, I was very surprised. I mean, as you feel, the only equation which is not absolutely standard in this model, as opposed to what you would teach on the grass, is the possibility that workers may want to catch up. Uh, and that's an old discussion in the labor literature uh, between the Phillips curve and the, and the Phillips and the wage curve. Um, I was surprised that the coefficient we got and in one of the specifications is basically zero. In another specification is 0.2, but it's, it's very small. And you always have to worry that, yeah, maybe not yet. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's coming. And, I, you know, we, clear, we cannot rule this out. I'm sufficiently surprised that we put some weight on, on a probability that it, it actually happens. The thing we did not discuss in the paper, it didn't come up in the discussion, is markups. And there is, as you know, uh, a, a, a group of people who believe that inflation is due to greed. <laughs> and uh, it's very difficult. It, greed, I mean, we don't exactly know how to measure it. Uh, I think we capture part of that through the price spikes, the shortage. But I think people have in mind that's wider than that happens in distribution. The only thing I can say is I'm agnostic on that one as well, but we were able to explain price inflation without, uh, without invoking greed. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it's not there, but you know, as you saw, the price equation fits amazingly well without having to resort to it. Doesn't mean the issue is closed uh, or settled, but I was surprised as well. Great. Okay, we're going to oh. take, oh, do you want to get a question? Yeah, just super <laughs> briefly. First of all, if you look at the pictures Olivier showed of the model and the wage prediction, the price prediction, the price was almost exactly spot on. Insofar as the wages weren't spot on, wages were higher than what was expected, not lower than what was expected. So that goes a little bit the opposite direction um, in terms of the paper's finding on the greedflation, I'm agreeing with Olivier, on the greedflation <laughs> thesis um, and the like. Um, the other thing I just would observe is in terms of can we hope for margin compression to bring inflation down without wage growth slowing, without labor markets softening, um, unit labor costs since prior to the pandemic have increased by more um, than prices. And so if anything, it's possible that firms haven't fully passed through um, the increased wage costs. And that, again, is consistent with the model, the findings of the model in which, if anything, um, wage inflation has been a bit higher than you would have expected. Um, Great. Okay. Now we're going to take a couple of um, questions from the audience. We don't have a lot of time, but um, there'll be a mic coming around. Um, yeah. Tell us who you are, where you're from, please. Uh, Brian Sack, <laughs> formerly DG Hall in New York Fed. Um, so I'm going to direct this question to Jason, but I'm certainly interested um, in everyone's view. Um, you lump fiscal and monetary policy together as the original sinners, and I want to ask, you know, which is the bigger sinner in some sense? And I know it's, you know, I know it's, they're not perfectly separable, and obviously monetary policy is reacting to the economy, which is affected by fiscal policy. So it's not really clear how to do the counterfactual, but for example, if we had a normal-sized fiscal response uh, during COVID, uh, and monetary policy followed the type of approach that Rich sort of described, which was a delayed liftoff and then revert to a Taylor rule, and we had done QE. Uh, what's your guess at where uh, inflation would be today? Thank you. Yeah, let's take one more. May as well go right next door. <laughs> uh, thank you. Krishna Guho with Evercore Partners and also formerly of the New York Fed. Uh, so I wanted to ask Olivier and Ben, um, if I understood the presentation correctly, you anticipate that it'll be difficult to, and, and hard going, slow going, to bring down the underlying inflation rate from here, the component that's sort of Phillips curve related, if you like. Um, that, I think, must imply that you think we're operating along the vertical, the, along the horizontal segment of the Phillips curve at this point in time. If we were in a sort of, and I notice that Gauti's here, uh, if we were in sort of Gauti's inverse L, New Keynesian Phillips curve type world in which that labor supply curve itself has moved a bit during the pandemic. Is it possible that we're still on the easy down segment of that Phillips curve uh, as opposed to, in other words, still on the vertical part of that Phillips curve rather than the horizontal part? So it might actually be easier than in your model to get that 
uh, that underlying piece of inflation down. Thank you. Great. Okay. Jason? Apologies, Gouty, if I misrepresent <laughs> anything. All right, let's take the first one, a fiscal monetary yeah. policy. So, yeah. Great. And by the way, that inverse L is actually what we teach in our intro class and sort of the way I see the world um, for better or for worse. Um, so in, in answer to your question, Brian, I think the quantitatively larger sin was fiscal policy, especially for the year 2021. The less forgivable sin, though, was monetary policy. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. The fiscal choice was basically made in January 2021, although it didn't pass for another two months. The world was somewhat unclear at the time how much this was going to be a complete bounce back versus an economy that was still dragging. So I think there was considerably more fog at that moment. I have lower expectations for fiscal policy when they get the sign right, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, and, uh, and nothing happened really after that. Uh, monetary policy made the error again and again at meeting after meeting um, after March. It didn't really respond to or react or change anything um, when fiscal policy was quite different from what they'd originally built in. And I do have um, higher expectations for the Fed um, than just getting the sign right. And I think the Fed, by the way, caught up much faster than I was recommending and sort of got it back together, but you know, six months after... Um, it should have. And what do I think caused that? I think Fed policy became quite asymmetric. It became about shortfalls, not deviations. On unemployment, fate was you had to um, offset and undershoot, but not offset and overshoot. You couldn't lift off until you were at maximum employment, no matter where you were on inflation. You, could use a for you couldn't use a forecast to raise rates in expectation of inflation, but you could use a forecast to not raise rates because you were forecasting inflation would go away. And then initially, there was an asymmetry of the speed of movement. Rates could go down quickly. They couldn't go up quickly. Um, they dropped that last asymmetry. They dropped it much more firmly than even I could have thought they would have. So I think they caught up. I don't think anything they could have done could have stopped the inflation in 2021. But I think we'd probably have less today um, if they hadn't made that less forgivable error. Oh, sure. Does Rich want you want to give me? Yeah, press the button. Thanks. I said most of what I wanted to say in the 12 minutes. I, I do think that eventually there will be scholars who will look at this entire period and take advantage of the cross-country analysis to refine and sharpen their inferences, and I will just leave it at that. Great. And to Krishna's question? Okay. Yes, please. So I think there are two different objects, and I think you may have mixed them. There is the wage Phillips curve, and that we're talking about the slope of a, of a curve, the effect of labor market state on inflation. And then there is this other object, which is the output supply, which is this inverted L. Uh, I think that to the extent that we still have a number of firms which are on the vertical part of the inverted L, I mean, there are places where there are still shortages. And again, when you go to Google Trends, you seem to, think, you seem to find that people believe that there is. Uh, to the extent that this goes away, we'll get downward pressure on prices as firms go back to the horizontal segment. But what the last figure of our paper uh, suggests is that if you go to the wage Phillips curve, the coefficient on the labor uh, market variable, which is the uh, vacancy unemployment ratio, is significant but not very large. And so if you actually want to decrease inflation, you really have to decrease uh, the vacancy unemployment ratio by a lot, uh, which most likely translates into a fairly substantial increase in unemployment. But these are two separate issues. Okay, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. So I want to thank uh, all everyone for the lively conversation. We're now going to move to the second paper, which is by Goiti Egerson of Brown and Don Cohn of Brookings, where in the first part of the conversation, we talked about how did uh, inflation evolve and why. And now we're going to talk about essentially what we ended the last panel on, 
How did the Fed use the tools that it has, and what should we learn from the new framework that they put in place in August 2020 and the forward guidance that they issued? Goiti is going to speak first, and then Don, then Ellen Mead is going to respond, and then Goiti, Don, and Ellen will join me on stage for a conversation similar to the one that Luis just had. So, Goiti. Okay. Um, I'm uh, Goiti Eckerton. Uh, thanks a lot for um, to the organizer to uh, invite me uh, to speak here to this uh, and being in this distinguished panel with uh, you know three uh, grand old wise men that are legendary in the profession and me. So I decided to wear a tie to make up for my lack of gravitas and match. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the other authors here. Uh, so, uh, and I especially want to thank them to uh, uh, hook uh, me up with uh, Don Cohn, who, of course, is a legend at the Fed and rose from being a staff member to being a governor. I never went beyond the staff level. I sort of escaped to academia. And I had the brilliant idea when we started writing this, and Don may have think it's less brilliant in retrospect, that we would talk every week over Zoom, uh, for an hour or so, and for the first two months, we were talking, and Don asked me, so have you actually done anything? <laughs> and, and I sort of, not really in terms of writing anything up, that's not what I said, but I actually, I think, learned what had actually happened, and really learned more, more there in those three uh, months than I've learned sort of uh, uh, the last three years, I have to admit. Uh, so this is one of the more challenging papers uh, that I have uh, written, I have to say, uh, and you know, when p important people uh, speak on topics like this, they give disclaimers, it doesn't represent the view of this institution or another. My disclaimer would be different. Uh, this does not represent my view a year ago and may not represent my view one year from now. <laughs> I may even change my mind over lunch. I mean, so <laughs> the, uh, the truth is that the last couple of years have changed my priors and model. And that's, in that respect, it's very different from Olivia, which he sort of, you know, didn't seem to have changed his prior very much. Mine have radically changed. And that's in contrast to, you know, in response to the financial crisis and so on. I mean, I had worked on that under Ben's tutelage at Princeton. And I felt that we had sort of, you know, I felt roughly that uh, we had written a roadmap and the script, and everything sort of confirmed what I thought. But this uh, here really hasn't. Uh, so I was sort of an enthusiastic supporter of Team Temporary and an enthusiastic supporter of the new framework. And, uh, and uh, I even so enthusiastic that uh, I did, for the first time and only time in my life, I wrote an op-ed an enthusiastic support of Team Temporary. Uh, so what did it say? Uh, basically, <laughs> inflation, there's nothing to see here, not a problem. As good fortune would have it, it was written in Japanese. So, you know, uh, I don't think anybody will hold it against me in the future. But uh, I have a lot of things to say here, uh, so, and a lot of slides, so I think I better get on with it here. Uh, so what this paper is about is that uh, what we're trying to do is to try to understand if the change in the policy framework that Ben and, and company and Don, Don put together in uh, 2012 to the new framework in 2020, whether that may have played a role in the inflation run-up. Okay, and, and this is a very succinct document. That's what these pictures are supposed to tell you. It was in, attempted to give it names like Article 1, because there are seven paragraphs, and they're all very well thought out. Uh, so that's sort of our uh, assignment. So we're not really asking here how much of the inflation was caused by the Federal Reserve's uh, 20 policy framework, which is going to be my aggravation or straight up mistake. Instead, it's sort of, uh, in, there's a sense in which my account is going to be a little bit biased for this reason. We're sort of trying to ask, could it have? 
right? So it's sort of like a stress test. So it's going to be biased in the sense we're going to be looking for reasons for how it could have interplayed with uh, what we saw. And if so, uh, through what mechanism? And in a way, it's an ultimate stress test to the framework because, you know, you have once in a century shock that nobody anticipated and, you know, it was very strange, a lot of, lot of dimensions. So uh, I think a key conclusion, and, you know, when I see the 10 minute sign, I'm going to rush to main lessons and probably skip a bunch of slides. Uh, but sort of a key conclusion is that the framework was very well designed to deal with what people were really concerned with leading up to the uh, pandemic, which was sort of a world in which you have low R star and inflation below target. And, but exposed, it looks a little bit less well designed for sort of once in a century shock with a lot of unknowns, right? Unknown unknowns, like Rumpels would say. Uh, now, of course, the question going forward is, after COVID, will we get back to that environment where it was really designed for? And that's an open question. I mean, I've written uh, a record for me, probably not for Larry Summers, paper, five papers with him about secular stagnation. Uh, now he seems to have taken 180 degrees and thinks it's all gone. I mean, it's a sunk cost for me, but a little disappointing. Uh, but, but so I haven't made up my mind quite up about that. But I'm, I'm more actually in Olivia's camp there that I think we're going to get back there. So the question is then how uh, well the uh, framework is suited for that. Okay, so this is going to be the structure. And I'm going to start by um, talking about the lead up and uh, of, of the policy framework, what we call the mistake of uh, 2015 to 2019. I like the more punchy title of the mistake of 2015 because of Friedman's famous paper, The Mistake of 1873. This mistake is not, of course, of that order, but I think it frames, uh, I think, the mindset of people when they were writing uh, the policy framework. So let me just tell you first what that is and why I think it played an important role in how the framework is put together and how the framework dealt with it. So if you take a look at when, you know, the interest rate has stayed at zero throughout uh, since 2000, December 2008, uh, when uh, the Fed lowered, went down to the zero bound. So what happens then in 2015, unemployment is 5%. Fed is expecting uh, a tight labor market because their estimate was 4.9. Uh, and, uh, you know, start tightening, ra tightening rates. What happens? Well, they start tightening rate, but unemployment goes all the way down to, you know, 3.7 in July uh, 2019. And as you can see, basically no inflation pressures, right? You see, leading up to 2019, there's even deflationary pressure. So, in fact, the Fed starts cutting rates uh, in 2019, mid-2019, leading up to the pandemic because they want to try to reach the... Uh, reach the inflation target. Okay, so uh, if you think and look at what the FOMC was thinking when they were making that decision, so here what you see is in this blue, uh, in this blue uh, shaded area is the central tendency of the forecast of the FOMC at the time they made that decision start to tighten. So what you can see that they're expecting PCE inflation to gradually go back to target unemployment to gently go below uh, full, empl full employment and then go back to full employment as time moves along and uh, having to tighten along the way to get there, right? And then in the solid line, you see the thing went quite differently. Unemployment kept falling without any inflationary pressures. So, you know, in fact, they reversed uh, course and started cutting rates. Uh, now, what was their estimate of uh, uh, the you know, U star or the natural rate of unemployment in 2019. And it was a sense in which they were asking themselves, who knows, right, after having, you know, seen this dramatic reduction without any inflation pressures. So, okay, so the lesson people took from this was that uh, inflation per persi persistently below targets in 2008, and people were becoming very worried that this would start feeding into expectations and bring down uh, inflation expectation, which is a concern if you think that you're going to be hitting the zero bound a lot, right? Because that leaves you less room because inflation expectation is going to drag down the nominal rate. So, and if you then bought into the kind of story uh, many were telling, including me and, and, and Summers, that there's a permanently lower uh, natural rate of interest, possibly even negative, this, you know, could be a big issue. 
So the lesson learned then was uh, U is an imperfect, uh, unemployment is imperfect proxy for max employment. Uh, changes in U has very limited effects on, on pi, you know, in the inflation, the, the, in the Phillips River is flat, and there has been a persistent fall in R, and I think that sort of uh, formed the basis of the framework. This is just one example of a Fed policymaker that gave a talk here at Brookings. That's why I sort of put it up here. You know, that sort of summarizes this ni nicely, saying, you know, sensitivity to price to labor market tightness is very low. Flat Phillips curve has the important advantage. We can low let the labor market run hot with very little risk to inflation, which has big benefit because you include uh, and expand employment. Uh, and and in, in particular, uh, she suggested that with the new framework, that you would not repeat the kind of mistake made in 2015 had this new framework been in place. Uh, they would not uh, have withdrawn our accommodation uh, until, uh, until, the, uh, until uh, they would see clear evidence of, uh, you know, unemployment falling wouldn't have let them trigger. They would have to see clear evidence on the inflation side. So let's see then what they did with uh, the 2020 uh, framework and how that then led them to a forceful impl implementation in 2020, which uh, I think turned out to be very consequential. So major changes, we go to details in the paper by sort of textual analysis, is that first to define declining R and potential interaction with ELB as the central problem going forward. And this is very important change that I underappreciated at the time as an enthusiastic supporter of this uh, framework. They really, really replace from the old framework any deviation that penalized any deviation, deviation of employment from maximum with shortfall from maximum employment. So in other words, it became a one-sided uh, uh, objective function. We only care if an unemployment falls below our estimate. If it goes above, fine. Okay, so this was a very important uh, uh, change. They introduced a new tool of average inflation targeting, uh, implying an overshooting if uh, inflation was below target, but they were not specific about time horizon, and it was also asymmetric in that they were only going to uh, compensate for uh, uh, undershooting. And then they sort of, uh, and that's clear when you look at the statement, they literally in Article 2, as I would like to call it, you know, they were uh, listed their objective inflation, employment, and, and stability of long rates. They literally just moved un unemployment first, you know. And it's kind of hard to, in to interpret that in any other way, that that was going to become a bigger uh, uh, focus. And then they eliminate all examples in previous framework of how you start actually, that that is actually estimated and part of the policy decision making process. Okay, so why would it have prevented the mistake? Well, I just told you, well, you wouldn't be uh, uh, too concerned if unemployment was falling be below your estimate. Uh, you would wait for inflation to uh, uh, reach, uh, its, uh, reach its target. Okay, so what did this then mean uh, coming into the pandemic when they just introduced the framework? So what it meant was a forceful as uh, Powell put it, a forceful implementation of our framework. And what I think is key here, and uh, I under, and underestimated its significance until I was educated by uh, Don about it. So there's a key statement in September 2020 where the committee says it's going to keep the target range at zero to one quarter uh, until maximum unemployment is reached and inflation has risen to 2%, right? And projected to do, go over it for some time. So it's the and feature that is very interesting there, right? So uh, it seems like a very good solution, but to a wrong problem. It's an excellent solution to the problem faced in 2015. And you can kind of see, if you take a look at what people were expecting when they put this forward guidance in place, again, the, this is the central tendency in blue. They were expecting sort of a repeat of 2015, uh, that inflation gently going back to target, unemployment falling, and actually falling faster than in inflation would converge to target. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to raise rates for a very long time. Well, that was an excellent solution to the problem of 2015, but they were faced with a very different one when inflation started picking up before unemployment uh, went down. Okay, so in reality then, what happens is that when they finally tighten in March, unemployment is down to 3.5, basically pre-pandemic levels. Inflation, 7.7 as measured by PCE and 8.5 as measured by CPI, so very different from the scenario they were anticipating when putting in this forward guidance. So, in a sense, a brilliant solution, but it was it uh, uh, wasn't it a brilliant solution to the wrong problem because it seemed like there was insufficient attention given to, well, what if inflation were to rise before employment? The ant uh, stipulation seems to suggest that there was basically no bound on how much you would let inflation rise uh, before you tighten as long as you didn't think you were at maximum un unemployment. So, and I think there's some uh, evidence of this. And one, we talked about the fiscal uh, uh, expansion. Uh, if you look at the minutes of FOMC, once it that become clear that uh, there's going to be a big uh, uh, fiscal expansion, they basically say the benefit of our outcome-based gu guidance is we don't need to do anything until these two conditions are satisfied, right? And one thing that I found surprising was that in December 2021, when you have seen pretty substantial rise in inflation, uh, so the statement from 2020 isn't changed until in December 21, and at that point, uh, you know, they kind of just doubled down. We're not going to raise rates until employment reaches maximum, and it is not there yet in 2021. Uh, so, uh, but they predicted it will be satisfied uh, next year. So this is sort of them doubling down in December with inflation having exceeded 2%, which is an understatement perhaps. Uh, the committee expected to be appropriate to make to this target until labor market have reached uh, levels consistent with the committee's assessment of maximum employment. So this is the numbers that we're looking at, PCE 4.8, unemployment 4.25, prime age uh, 70.6, and, and if you take a look at uh, where they were in uh, March when they ra raised rates, unemployment and prime age population ratio is just basically ex exactly the same levels as pre-pandemic. So it seems almost like they literally waited uh, to lift until these max employment were exactly hit. And that seems to me a little bit uh, problematic. Now, so I have little time, so I'm not going to bore you very much with these equations uh, because I have little time, except just to say that I think there was an, the way people were thinking about this was mostly looking at reaction function and simulation them in the model. I think it would have been useful, and I think it is useful for the next framework and analysis, to think about this in terms of objectives of the Fed and the implication of changing that objective. And here, what they were really doing, rather than having a symmetric objective, uh, which is if the, the, the lambdas were the same on the lam labor employment, they were really saying, okay, we don't care if there's an overshoot in unemployment, we're going to put all our emphasis on uh, shortfalls. So as long as if you have a lag in the way in which policy is set, so you set interest rate, which is IP, before you realize the other variables, it's just a, the most reduced form simple uh, model you can imagine, what you're going to get is that this is going to be an expression for inflation. What you're going to get there is going to be a bias in inflation. The Fed is going to be less willing to make a policy that risks a shortfall than an overshoot. In equilibrium, that's going to mean that more often than not, you're going to get an overshoot. Uh, and here, the uh, formula for inflation overshoot, you see sort of different uh, exp possible explanations for uh, why there was an overshoot. The most important one that I'm going to emphasize is that the Fed overestimated maximum employment. And here, maybe I'll uh, disagree a little bit with uh, my old advisor and, and Olivier. Uh, so uh, the inflation bias is, is essentially here, uh, what I just said. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to say that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, in fact, the, the framework was explicitly designed to overcorrect uh, deflationary bias. It was trying to, you know, offset it because they were concerned with uh, fall. And so I'm not necessarily saying this was a, uh, 
bad or unintended, conse unintended consequence, but, you know, trying to uh, tease out whether, they, whether it went too far or not, I think is something we need to study. Uh, I have an, we have in an appendix uh, 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 an example where this could also potentially lead to a perception bias, but I feel that the empirical evidence on that is not very encouraging. Don was very set skeptical of this having any relevance whatsoever, so I just put it, we just put it in an appendix where it's there to die, uh, but you know, I encourage you to uh, read Appendix B. Uh, <laughs> okay. So how did it play out? And I'm just going to go very quickly. Five minutes has not come up yet, has it? Okay. So I'm going to go quickly to this so I can get to lessons learned. Okay, so how did it play out in possible interaction with the framework? So here you see uh, the super core. And what I want to point out to you is that, so I wrote my uh, team temporary uh, uh, article right around when the super core was low, and I was convinced, okay, this was all temporary. What I find a little bit surprising is that in the fall, when you have supercore that excludes all of these controversial uh, components, is that the Fed was still, uh, you know, not really giving any caveats for inflation overshoot until you reach maximum employment, uh, and uh, not really doing anything until in uh, March uh, there. So I think an important uh, feature, so it seemed to became a, become a binding constraint, having reached maximum employment, so I think it was an important feature in which they overestimated the degree of uh, what was the maximum unemployment, uh, uh, employment. And part of it was that unemployment was still below pre-pandemic levels that you can see there. This is basically the decision period. Right after the fiscal stimulus, they could have tightened in between then March 2001 to 2022, right? So unemployment was still back to pre-pandemic level. It reached it 20, March 22. Uh, prime age uh, uh, employment to population had not reached pre-pandemic level until March 22. However, if you looked at things like uh, labor tightness, that was V over U that we discussed, that was at its tightest level since World War II. They're basically, and it reached over one in May 21. And there are five periods, essential periods, when it is th this tight, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the run-up of the Vietnam War, COVID. So I think, and all five episodes were associated with inflation surges. So to me, that suggests that, A, this was an important indicator that the labor market was tight. B, and that's where I disagree with uh, 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 my esteemed advisor and, uh, uh, and his esteemed co-author, uh, that I think it may have been... Uh, playing a bigger role than they, uh, than they made it out to be. Uh, so why was the sending conflicting signal there? I think we agree that th there was just change in spending patterns. Uh, how do I, do I, why do I disagree with their conclusion? Because if you look at empirical evidence that directly looks at how theta or, or, or uh, U over V interacts with inflation, you see that once it crosses one, there seems to be some change in, this is just the raw data. Uh, we have more sophisticated empirical analysis, including using another empirical framework of Blanchard uh, uh, to suggest that uh, there was something going on there as data goes above one. And this here is just the raw data from metropolitan areas in the U.S., and you have the red here denoting post-COVID, and it seems awfully consistent with uh, uh, a nonlinear Phillips curve. Okay, so summary. Uh, asymmetric loss function, overestimating of max employment, nonlinearities, inflation. Let's go to the lessons learned. So the first thing I want to point out is that, okay, things may have gone wrong on some dimensions, but let's recognize employment is now back to where it was pre-pandemic. And amazingly, you know, we may argue that some mistakes were made, but, you know, Fed has retained its credibility, and that's to great credit of the leadership in its communication and, and you know, whatever fault the, the, the new framework may have, you know, this is, I think, a really strong measure of success. Uh, but if to summarize big themes that we have in the concluding session is that I do think, we do think that one-sided employment objective give rise to a host of complications that we still not fully understand and the AIT was pretty one-sided and vague, and I think people didn't really know how much inflation would be permitted. The second big theme 
was that forward guidance issued under the new framework really amplified the inflationary bias already implicit. Uh, and I think that was uh, an ingenious solution to the 2015, but a lot more problematic when inflation overshoots target before you are uh, sure about the employment situation, which is very difficult to assess, especially in this period. Uh, it was less suitable for an inflation undershoot, overshoot than the other way around. Uh, required reading employment when it was very hard to uh, judge. Uh, for the framework, uh, the next framework, I think, should be tested against considerably more in different stress scenarios. Our sort of, and I will emphasize tentative, uh, conclusion is that on balance, the complication created by the asymmetries probably creates more problem than it solves. Uh, so, you know, the penalty would be small if the Phillips curve is flat. But if there's nonlinearity, there may be some significant uh, problems associated with it, uh, and the cost uh, non-trivial. Uh, the uh, having a better understanding of uh, uh, how the forward guidance discipline the policy framework uh, should be uh, part of the discussion, and uh, the asymmetry put extra pressure on judging maximum unemployment, which is inherently a pretty difficult task lessons for forward guidance, and then I'm going to end. Uh, so it is a very valuable tool, and conditional-based forward guidance is certainly a lot better than calendar-based. So in that respect, I think uh, it was uh, a good element of the forward guidance. But I think it was not well designed if inflation moved ahead of unemployment, and I think that was a problem. Uh, and lack of clear and transparent definition of max employment, I think in the next review, it would be useful to have an exact definition of that, and, you know, we need to recognize that con conditions are never going to conform to those envisioned when we set the forward guidance. Uh, uh, sometimes even some flexibility in guidance uh, won't be enough to allow, uh, you know, the uh, committee to, uh, to adjust to very situation and when it was expected. Uh, and, you know, uh, in un unusual situation, I think it should be adjusted with meetings, and I saw it is a little bit peculiar, the September 2020 was set up for a very different scenario than was realized, yet it was only changed in December 2021, and then in a way just to double down on reaching the employment target. Okay, so uh, I think I'm out of time, so let me le then leave it this, uh, and the rest of the paper and the slides are online, so I hope you have time to take a look at those. Thank you. So I just click forward and okay. There we go. Well, thanks to the Hutchings Center, Hutchings Center for inviting me to join you today in this important uh, discussion. I think it's great that Brookings is kicking off the Fed's next framework season with these two important papers. And Egerton and Cohn, I'm going to call it the EK paper, assesses the contribution of the 2020 framework to the surge in inflation. Um, we've gotten a good summary, a quite complete summary, and my comments aren't going to focus on everything in the paper, but on a few uh, topics that, that I thought were important to raise. But the overall paper is well worth reading, and, um, and I hope we'll discuss more uh, in the later discussions about the recommendations um, that were just reviewed because they really make a valuable contribution. So stock-taking exercises or postmortems are important. Um, that's what really this is all about. Um, there was a research conference that uh, we held at the Chicago Fed um, in 2019 as part of the framework review that included a postmortem uh, stock-taking exercise by Everly Stock and Wright. Um, and that exercise was not about understanding the causes of the global financial crisis, but about the effectiveness of the Fed's policy in promoting the economic expansion that began in 2009. I think there's a higher hurdle this time in the stock-taking exercise because we need to assess both cause and effect. Um, how much did the new framework contribute? What about that forward guidance, um, which was really the implementing language for the framework? What about the view on the evolution of the pandemic? 
and the extent to which factors boosting inflation were transitory, supply-related, would resolve over 2021, or the underestimation of the strength of the labor market. And you throw all of these in the pot together, and it's a little bit hard to sort out. I personally uh, think the authors weigh a little too heavily on the actual 2020 framework document itself, uh, rather than uh, a lot of these other factors, although they do bring them in over the course of the paper. Um, so um, the 2019 stock taking um, applied to the Fed's actions from 2009. Um, and the authors at that time used the Fed's 2012 framework to go back and evaluate act actions taken as of 2009. And this was appropriate um, because the 2012 framework was an articulation and clarification of the strategy the Fed had been following for some time. And similarly, the 2020 framework articulated an approach to policy that was evolving, but which began to play an important role in decision making in the 20 teens with respect to the thinking about both dual mandate goals. And I'll come back to this a bit more later. So um, mindset is important. Um, EK tell us that. Uh, and um, the Everly Stock and Wright analysis affected the Fed's thinking. Uh, on the eve of the pandemic. We can see that. The, that stock taking concluded that the forward guidance and LSAP tools had played an important role in speeding the economic recovery, uh, but could have been even more helpful if they'd been rolled out sooner and more forcefully. And that's something the Fed did, uh, took very much on board in its pandemic response in March 2020. Um, the Everly Stock and Write analysis is consistent with um, Egerton and Cohn's view about regret about the decision to lift off uh, in 2015. The unemployment rate could have been reduced further with negligible effect on inflation um, if the Fed had waited. And uh, Egerton and Cohn see that as an informative, as a formative uh, experience for the Fed. So Eggerson and Cohn um, described the mindset that surrounded the 2020 framework review, the lower neutral rate, implying a greater likelihood that policy rates would hit the effective lower bound and attendant risks associated with associated trips to the ELB for achievement of the dual mandate goals. Um, a potential downward spiral as underachievement of the inflation goal uh, lowers inflation expectation and further reduces the Fed's policy space. And there were significant important research contributions from inside and outside the Fed. Um, the authors give us a nice review of the issue and associated findings. And I agree with them that this mindset about the most important problem facing policymakers dominated thinking coming into the framework review in 2019. And indeed, the new in the new framework statement, uh, we, the framework statement retained the original first paragraph, but highlighted this issue in a new second paragraph. But what that meant was that the new framework was very specific to a particular problem. It wasn't a broad articulation of goals and principles as the 2012 framework statement had been, but it had narrowed the focus to a particular very significant pressing issue. And um, uh, Eggerson and Cohn uh, criticized the narrowness of the framework because it left undefined how the Fed would behave in the event of inflation surge, which as likely as it seemed at the time is what actually occurred. So I agree with their recommendation that the next policy framework um, should, should be robust to a broad range of possibilities. But they used the term scenarios and stress tests, and I wasn't sure exactly what they were advocating. It sounded more like a framework manual, maybe, than a broad statement of principles um, uh, as the two prior framework statements have been. Um, but in any event, a framework statement of goals and principles, whether broad or narrow, meets other communications that spell out the tactics, and this brings us to the forward guidance. Um, and, and forward guidance in 2012, forward guidance in 2020, um, uh, uh, were part of implementing uh, a framework. Uh, the December 2012 conditional forward guidance around um, the policy rate and around asset purchases included full-throated escape clauses in the event of inflation inflation surge. But the forward guidance in September and, and December 2020 was very muscular and didn't possess similar escape hatches. Um, I, I won't repeat here because um, 
Gowdy did such a nice job of, of laying it out on his slides. But the key question was um, uh, that the Fed expected to remain at the effective lower bound until it had achieved both maximum employment and 2% inflation uh, with an expected overshoot. And I think they're right uh, to criticize this aspect of the forward guidance, but I don't think it's correct to say, as they do, that the September 2020 statement, quote, implied that the Fed would not tolerate any level of inflation without acting if employment had not reached maximum. Um, to be fair, um, there was a final new paragraph introduced in the statement in 2020 that provided an out. Um, that paragraph said the committee could, quote, adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate if risks emerged that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. And in assessing that appropriate stance, um, the committee would consider labor market conditions, inflation pressures, and inflation expectations. And I've added that language there. So should the escape clause have been in the conditional forward guidance um, as it was back in 2020? I think that would have been clearer and, and more explicit, um, but it's not correct to say that the FOMC had completely tied its hands. So, um, uh, Eckerson and Cohen also point out that the committee could simply have adjusted the forward guidance at any of its meetings. And I agree, it's not clear why the FOMC waited so long to make meaningful language adjustments. Um, uh, you know, you have the, the language not really being adjusted. Uh, still in November 2021, the committee saying that inflation having persistently run below its longer run goal. Um, the committee will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. And at that point, you know, inflation had been averaging 2% since early 2021. So the language adjustment didn't really occur until the December 2021 meeting. I, I'm in complete agreement with them on this point. And now let me turn to some other changes in the 2020 framework uh, on the maximum employment side of the mandate. And here's where I have a, a good bit of disagreement with their interpretation. So they point to three important changes on the maximum employment side of the mandate. First, the ordering of the goals was changed throughout the statement to be consistent with the ordering of the goals in the Federal Reserve Act. Um, they say, quote, it seems difficult to find an alternative interpretation to this change than that the Federal Reserve wanted to communicate its increased attention to this part of the dual mandate. But how can a change that simply lines up ordering in the framework statement with the Federal Reserve Act um, reflect an increased attention beyond what's in the act itself. Second, um, there are these new words, um, a more expansive definition of maximum employment, which characterize maximum employment as a, quote, broad-based and inclusive goal. Um, and they see this characterization, these new words, together with the dropping of the median longer run normal unemployment rate from the SEP as opening the door, this is a quote, for considering the status of subsections of the nation based on income or other defining characteristic. So let me look first at this SEP uh, item that was dropped, this figure that was cited. And it was cited by way of example. The uh, original statement said it was an example. And I've always thought that was because the SEP is not a committee forecast. Uh, it's a collection of individual forecasts premised on individual assumptions of appropriate monetary policy. So dropping the reference to a number that's not endorsed by or reflective of the committee or agreed to in a consensus fashion from a document that is a consensus document doesn't seem inappropriate to me. Uh, the framework statement retained language saying that maximum employment is, quote, not directly measurable, changes over time owing largely to non-monetary factors that affect the structure and dynamic of the labor market and that it wouldn't make sense, uh, would not be appropriate to specify a fixed goal for employment and that in making its assessment, the, consider, the committee would consult a wide range of indicators. So many aspects of the earlier statement were preserved. Um, since the mid-20-teens, the FOMC has been communicating its attention to a broad range of labor market ind indicators, both internally and externally. Staff presentations to the FOMC have routinely included metrics such as unemployment rates by race and ethnicity. In June 2016, the NPR included a box examining whether gains from the post-GFC expansion had been widely shared. And subsequent NPRs included boxes analyzing labor market outcomes, housing, returns to education, other topics for different demographic groups. So to me, the addition of the words broad-based and inclusive merely acknowledged 
that the FOMC did not take a summary statistic approach to evaluating maximum employment. And the committee continued to say, as it had in 2012, that it saw maximum employment as largely determined by non-monetary factors. Um, further, um, they note that um, some policymakers had highlighted the potential gains for some groups due to the new framework. Um, and, and I think I agree with that. Um, statements about potential gains um, uh, were related to demographics of the labor market in the late stages of the expansion, which connects to the third change that they highlight, which is the introduction of asymmetry with respect to the employment leg of the mandate, that the committee would seek to mitigate short shortfalls of employment from assessments of its maximum level rather than deviations as in the prior framework. So thus the uh, Fed would ignore overshoots of employment, which it saw as having little implication for inflation given the flatness of the Phillips curve. And they use a simple model to illustrate that this asymmetry leads to an expansionary bias in policy and generates an inflation bias. And as they note, if the Phillips curve's flat, the size of the inflation bias could be quantitatively tr trivial, but the gains in employment could be large. In June 2016, the Teal Book document circulated to policymakers ahead of each FOMC meeting began including a new loss function in its optimal control simulations. And that loss function assigned a zero weight to unemployment uh, outcomes below the natural rate. So that loss function placed an asymmetric weight on the unemployment gap. And these simulations are available on the FETS website and Teal Book materials from June 2016 onward and available through the end of 2017. The Teal Book said, quote, policymakers choose this relatively low path for the policy rate because the desire to raise inflation to 2% is not tempered by any aversion to the undershooting of the natural rate that helps achieve this outcome. Tighter labor market causes inflation to reach 2% more quickly than in the case of equal weights. Um, thus, this asymmetric loss function was recognized as having an inflation bias in the Teal Book, one helpful for meeting the 2% inflation goal and was not motivated by a singular desire to boost employment or help disadvantaged groups. Um, I'm close in time, right? So I need to kind of, I'm out of time. Okay, so let me give one final comment because I have to skip, um, uh, yeah. Um, and that's on whether the 2020 framework provided the death knell for pre preemptive policy action. Um, I saw the framework very much as downgrading estimates of U-star in the policy making process, but I didn't see it as throwing preemptive policy away the way uh, Egertson and Cohn do. The statement continues to say, um, the framework statement, that the committee's policy decisions reflect its medium-term outlook in addition to its longer-run goals and assessments of the balance of risk. And I'd point you to comments in um, Loretta Mester's remarks earlier this year at the Monetary Policy Forum where she said um, that the FOMC should have acted sooner to address inflation but didn't see the de delay as having been generated by an absence of preemption so much as overly optimistic forecasts for inflation. Um, she sees the framework changes as reflecting uncertainty around assessments of maximum unemployment. Quote, given that we don't know where USTAR is, policymakers should not base policy solely on what could be an overstated estimate of this construct. So to conclude, because I know I'm out of time and, and we've left the discussion of tapering of asset purchases for later, I really enjoyed reading this paper and thanks for giving me the opportunity to discuss it. I'm going to make a slight change. Kristen Forbes is going to, oh, no, you're up, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. Come up. Yeah, come on up. I'm up. Uh, well, thank you both. Ellen, I think you're on the end. Well, that's what, I'm just following directions. Not very well, obviously. But. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm kind of struck by listening to this conversation of observation I've made about the Fed in the past that everybody at the Fed is fighting the last war, but everybody's fighting a different last war. <laughs> and the case you've made here is that the, uh, in the statement, the Fed was fighting the 2015-2019 period, and it turned out to be inappropriate. Um, Don, I want to ask you about a couple things uh, that have come up in the conversation and, and, and pick up also on something that, uh, that Ellen said at the end. 
Um, uh, it seems to me that I, I worry a little bit that Gauti discovered the framework, <laughs> read it with the care of a Talmudic scholar, and has now determined that everything that happened to monetary policy in the last few years can be found in the parsing of the wording of the framework. But it seems to me that there's quite a difference between the framework and the forward guidance, and that there's a tension here between forward guidance, which obviously has its place, particularly at times when we're at the zero lower bound, but it, in this case, seems to have prevented the Fed from doing what it has been asked to do so often in the past, which is be nimble. So I wonder if you could distinguish for us how much of the problem was the framework and the mindset, and how much was the specifics of the forward guidance and the inertia that it induced in, in the Fed reaction when fiscal policy turned out to be so big and inflation a little worse than anticipated? Sure. Uh, so I think the, frame, the forward guidance, in, at least importantly, grew out of the framework. And, uh, and Gowdy put up the quote from Jay, Cap, Jay Powell, who's, which said the forward guidance was a forceful implementation of the framework. Now, it is true that the forward guidance went way beyond the framework. So in the framework, there, there's the asymmetry, the labor market asymmetry, but it doesn't imply that policy should be, that the nominal rate should be zero up until the time you get to full employment. It just says that you shouldn't be reacting. I, I think it does, Ellen, imply about preemption. I mean, it says you shouldn't be reacting to what you think are overly tight uh, labor markets because they're going to cause inflation with a lag. And that lack of preemption was contained in the forward guidance in, in, the, in the Fed's announcement. So the announcements before September 2020 talked about expected and anticipated <laughs> conditions. The announcements from September 2020 on did not. They only talked about actual getting to full employment. So I do think that 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 um, piece of the framework influenced the uh, forward guidance, uh, but the forward guidance was um, much more, I think, to blame than the framework. But I don't think you can really separate them. Uh, to, uh, the the more I thought about the forward guidance, as Gowdy and I were working on this, the less sense it made. So in, in, what, in, what, in what model, what world, should you be at a negative, at the highest real interest rate at full employment would be minus two. That's if inflation expectations were anchored at two. So they said we are gonna get all the way to full employment at a minus, at a minus real interest rate. I don't mean to be looking at rich. I shouldn't be looking at rich. <laughs> but, and, and it seems to me that guarantees a rather substantial overshoot, certainly of full employment, and likely, even with a flat Phillips curve, to some extent of, with inflation. So it was kind of a very extreme version of the don't preempt and be very, very easy as you get to full employment and don't worry about, and don't worry about overages. So I, I really, and then the other part of the forward guidance was the guidance that came later on the, um, on the taper, and then the stuff that said, we're gonna warn you before we even announce, as we're even thinking about taper, we're gonna tell you that we're thinking about it, then we'll announce the taper and we won't lift off rates until the taper is finished, until we're no longer buying securities. And I thought that uh, that just added another bunch of inertia to the policy process that really wasn't, wasn't necessary. Rich, I agree that if the Fed had lifted off a couple months earlier, uh, which was e even, I, I think, I, I think it's hard to imagine it would be much before September, October, November of, of the fall. It wouldn't have made that much of a difference in inflation, but it would have started the process, and it would have taken a little something off, and I think it would have helped the credibility of the Federal Reserve, 
to recognize the problem first, uh, earlier, and not get to December 2021, when inflation was several percentage points above the goal, seem very persistent and say we're still not at full employment, so we can't raise interest rates. Those escape clauses were there, or I guess that escape clause was there, but it was never discussed. Mm -hmm. It never came up in any conversation. And so I think maybe you're right, we should be careful that we don't say that there was an inescapable uh, commitment here, but the fact that no one really ever discussed the escape clauses uh, strikes me that the Fed itself was thinking it had a pretty strong commitment to wait to full employment almost whatever the inflation rate was. You know, Don, in all my years of covering the Fed, you were never that emphatic about anything when we were interviewing you. I kind of, I, I wish we could roll back the clock. Um, it does seem, just to add one thing before I turn to Ellen, I thought, I think you raised a question I was going to ask, like, would it really have made any difference if they tightened policy six months earlier? And I think you suggest that we might have had slightly less inflation. It does seem to me that another element is we wouldn't have had to have such rapid rate increases, and we are now learning that those have some unintended consequences. Ellen. Do I have to turn this no, on or it's is on. it on? No, it's on. No, you just turned it off, Don. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, I just wanted to respond, Don, to a couple of things that you said. Um, one of the reasons I think of the forward guidance as being implementing language for the framework, but quite separate from it, is you know it can be revised every six weeks. It has a smaller group of people that vote on it, and um, the hurdle is not consensus. Indeed, as you guys point out, there were two dissents at the September 2020 meeting. So um, I think the forward guide, just because of the governance issues, makes it a more nimble um, sort of thing. And, and um, uh, But yet I do agree with you that it was um, uh, very muscular. Now the question is, would it have been, you know, if, if those, uh, the vacancy to unemployment uh, data had been paid better attention to over the summer of 2021, the Fed might have reached the conclusion that maximum employment had been achieved without getting the unemployment rate and the labor force participation rate back to pre-pandemic levels. That would have made all the difference, right? So that's not about the forward guidance per se, but about a judgment of the economy. Yeah. Kathy, could you talk a little bit about the um, tapering? So. Jay Powell's view was that it doesn't make sense to be buying bonds while you're raising interest rates because it's like stepping on the brake and the gas at the same time, although I believe the Bank of England actually did that. Mm -hmm. um, and you argue that they needn't have waited for, uh, to end the asset purchases before raising rates. Could you walk us through the argument there and why you think they had the wrong sequencing or, or they thought they had to have a sequencing? Yeah, so... Um one of the things that I didn't have time to talk about was the additional, and we talk about in the paper, was the uh, additional inertia that was created by uh, the quantitative easing measures. And then the Fed sort of said that A, they would give very long warning for when they would start, and B, they wouldn't start raising rates until that was completed. The argument being that you know the asset purchases were stimulative, while the interest rate were uh, restrictive. Uh, I suppose I don't see any uh, inconsistency in, you know, slow and orderly, uh, you know, resolution of the asset purchases whose impact is mostly at the time they are announced. Uh, and to, to my view has a lot to do with smoothing market functioning uh, and then at the same time start raising rate like indeed the Bank of England uh, did. So I don't see, I think they created an unnecessary barrier there that may have played some role in the delay, although I don't know how much. Just want to uh, respond very quickly to a couple of other uh, issues, right? So like you correctly say, uh, what we are doing in this paper is like a Talmud scholar looking at uh, the, in the, could the, you know, new framework had played a role it's really not a sober assessment of how much role it play. I view it more as I thought my home assignment was sort of being the devil's advocate here and asking the question, could it have? And then through what mechanism? And that's sort of what we're trying to spell out here. If I were, would have been asked the question, which was more Blanchard and uh, Bernanke's, uh, you know, uh, 
trying to explain this earth through different mechanisms, I think it would have written a very different paper. Instead, this was focusing on that element, could it, right, and then how. Uh, you know, I think I will have to, uh, you know, I haven't come to full <laughs> determination of, you know, parsing out how much each contributed. And then a, a little bit about the uh, uh, issue of, so what we were not saying in the paper was that the forward guidance in September uh, 2020, uh, uh, in, in September 2020, we were not saying that that actually bound the hands of the Fed. Uh, what was surprising to me, because there is an escape clause, what was very ex ex surprising to me is how much the view seemed to believe that it did. And that comes out pretty clearly in the discussions, even at the time they changed the language in December 2021, 20, uh, where, you know, I think it would have been reasonable to say that you had reached uh, max employment, but they sort of, in a way, doubled down and say, actually, we're not there quite yet. So to me, the surprise was that they didn't sort of, uh, when there was a surge, try to use the escape clause, hone a little bit the forward guidance, in instead of leaving it unchanged for more than a year. And that is sort of more uh, our criticism as opposed to claiming that it was a strict binding constraint. I, I don't think it was, but I think to a surprising degree it was treated as such. Um, Don, uh, you make a point at the end of the very last recommendation that there's too much, essentially too much groupthink at the Fed and that there wasn't enough diversity of view. Um, this is a comment that's often made about the Fed. Uh, I think sometimes with justification and sometimes not, uh, given the famous stories about the Federal Open Mouth Committee. Um, but I was intrigued by you suggested whether there's something about the decision-making process at the FOMC that is discouraging a more fulsome discussion of alternative views and dissents. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little about that, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. Well, I think um, this is another irony, David, relative to where I was, because <laughs> I spent at least four years helping Ben get a consensus on the committee and reduce the number of dissents that we might have. Um, but I think as an, as an outsider, it did strike me as I thought about this period with all these very difficult questions that were being discussed in the public, right? It's not as if this is totally ex post. I mean, as Jason and others pointed out, there were potential inflationary implications of fiscal policy, et cetera. How few dissents there were, essentially no dissents, between the time the forward guidance was put in and June, I guess, of uh, 2022. And I, and so I, you know, I haven't read the transcripts. I wasn't inside the meetings, but you wonder how vigorously alternative perspectives were being reflected in the, in the meetings. You can look to a certain extent to the, the uh, projections because they have uh, a central tendency and a broad a range of projections. And at least until, I think until the early part of 2022, that was a pretty narrow set of, set of views. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's uh, hard. I also wonder, I don't, so I think uh, really the point I was trying to make, or we were trying to make in that, last, in that last recommendation was should the Federal Reserve itself just do a self-examination of how it's, it's making these decisions. An awful lot of stuff happens in the week before the FOMC where the consensus is formed, uh, decisions essentially get made, um, announcements are written, et cetera, and whether that leads to enough um, challenge of the, of the existing uh, consensus, I think, is, is a question. Hmm. I'm thinking as you speak, I can't, my chronology is not right, but I suspect in some parts of this time they're meeting remotely because of COVID. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. so that, yeah. we know that that right. eliminates the coffee uh, right. uh, break conversation. Right. Right. Um, um, I'm gonna turn to the audience now. Uh, uh, Jason and Steve Leisman and Mike Kelly and David Wilcox. So that should bring us home. Let me take two questions at a time and then we'll do it. 
Uh, my question is, what do you think of this comment? Um, I understand <laughs> fiscal policy trying to learn from the mistakes of the past. 2009 through 12 was way too small, and fiscal policy was compensating for that in the other direction. I think they overcompensated for it. I never understood at the time, and I don't understand in retrospect, why people thought monetary policy made much of a mistake at all from 2005 through 2019. I think there was too much self-flagellation around that. The inflation rate was sort of 1.7, 1.8. It's 20 to 30 basis points off. I'm willing to stipulate that if the Fed gets inflation to 2.2, there won't be a person in the country saying that that's above um, their target. They'll say 2.2 is 2. So looking back on it, you know, why should we think the Fed got anything lower than maybe an A minus, an A minus before all the inflation of recent decades um, in grades for its performance from 25 to 2019? And there was sort of no mistake to really learn from uh, there. Steve Leisman. Steve, can you stand up so the mic can find you? Thanks, and thanks uh, for putting that together this conference. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I don't remember reporting on the Fed and thinking they are or are not following the, the statement, the long-run policy statement. So I just wonder if you guys have thought about how influential it really was in the making of policy. And then just one other, one other thing. Um, how do you factor in sort of, I guess the best way to put it is facts on the ground rather than the kind of theoretical framework, which is, if you remember, in, in September 21, the chair was waiting for the benefits to run out, thinking that would result in uh, an influx of workers to the workforce. How does that factor in? And then, again, in December 2021, there was the, the, the Omicron wave, which, I don't know, maybe helps explain the failure of the Fed to pivot. I don't know. I'm as, maybe as confounded as you are about that. But there were those two things that seem to be kind of outside the framework that you're looking at. Thanks. Right. I mean, the point you raised, Steve, is that, and I think Loretta Mester made it, maybe it's just a bad forecast or we're overemphasizing. Does someone want to take uh, Jason's question about was there a mistake in 2015 to 19 that needed to be fixed? Um, I mean, I, I thought it was very reasonable at the time to be concerned about continuous decline in our star uh, and uh, you know and that was starting to show up possibly in fall and inflation expectation that would leave even less room for interest rate cuts in the future so yeah I mean you know missing a target by uh, small amounts in itself is not a big deal but I think they were looking forward to a more serious problem down the pike if that they were getting gradually less and less room. And I think that was a perfectly legitimate thing to be concerned about at the time. But I th actually uh, disagree a bit with my <laughs> co-author here <laughs> in the sense that I, I, I look at the framework as having two important pieces. One is the average inflation targeting, which is really meant to deal with the zero lower bound, the effective lower bound, is very similar to as Rich Clarida pointed out in a speech on this stage, is very similar to Ben Bernanke's temporary price level targeting. That's to deal with that. But I think the asymmetry in the labor market approach is to deal with a, a different, a really a different problem, which was we overestimated how high or underestimated how high employment could go before inflation picked up we thought the Phillips curve was too flat, et cetera. And uh, it's not really the same as the ELB problem. And there, I, th I, th I think, um, and, and our conclusion was we really need to go back and rethink that piece of the asymmetry. Is that necessary to address the issues we might be facing or the costs of that asymmetry bet more than the benefits uh, might have been. I think the flat Phillips curve, uh, and Jason has pointed this out in writing, is a two-edged sword because if you go past and inflation, if the Phillips curve is very flat, you go past full employment and inflation only begins to pick up a little bit, you've got a long way to go back in order to get inflation back to your 2% target. So inflation doesn't pick up much when you overshoot, but it doesn't go down much 
when you come back. So uh, I think, I hope that the framework, and maybe this will be part of the next panel discussion, that the framework focuses a bit on that piece of the asymmetry is it really, if we re, even if we return to a low R star, low inflation world, is that piece of the asymmetry still necessary to get the benefits? I agree there are benefits from running a hot labor market, uh, but there may be other ways of getting those benefits. So I just think it needs a, a And, and I think that, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, when I went to some of those Fed Listen events, and I had the feeling that policymakers really did think, Jason, that they could have had a better employment picture if they hadn't been so tight-fisted. Yeah. And that maybe it wasn't big in tenths of a percentage point, but confronting people over and over again influenced them to think we, where we want to take the risks. I, 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 that's the case. I'm yeah. 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 Right. Right. And, and actually, the page of comments that I deleted from my uh, presentation was on the Fed listens and the role that I think it played psychologically in people's thinking going into, because of course we couldn't engage um, businesses a bit, but you couldn't engage community groups and, and community colleges and labor market groups and so on on inflation because there was no inflation. There was nothing to talk about. They didn't understand the questions, right? But if you asked them about the labor market, you heard all about problems that were being solved that ultimately hmm. were bringing people on the margins back in, you know. Okay, Chris, can you bring the mic down to Rich? And meanwhile, can someone give the right, Mike Kiley, wave your hand. We'll get Mike Kiley, David Wilcox, and then we'll let Rich have ex extra. Yeah, I don't, we kind of didn't answer Steve's Steve, yeah. question. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think there is an issue. I'd be interested in Ellen's perspective on this, that this statement is issued in January and rarely referred to afterwards. Now, I think it did inform the forward guidance. And everybody, you, Mr. Leesman, and everyone else, is, are totally focused on the forward guidance because that tells you something about what might happen at the next meeting and the meeting after that and the meeting after that. But it would be helpful for the Federal Reserve, I think, in their communication every once in a while to take a deep breath look back and say how this fits into the framework. And in that regard, I think I hope that when they re-examine the framework, this issue of what happens when the goals aren't totally aligned, when you're above one and below another, needs a little more attention and a little more care, and because that's the situation they, at least they thought they were in, although uh, I think the U over V suggests they weren't the situation wasn't quite as contradictory as they as they thought. Okay. Could I just add one more sure. thing to that? Sure, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, your, uh, you know, I too thought that the framework didn't play much of a role, except there were a few conf press conferences where I recall Chair Powell saying something about the paragraph. It's really about supply shocks when the goals are not right. complementary, right? And then he mentioned balanced approach, which of course was the language that was deleted from <laughs> from the new framework statement, but. Um, he would go to that paragraph uh, because that's the issue, you know, that they were most thinking about was these supply shocks. And in terms of the question about, you know, I, I remember there being a focal point around September 2021 when the extended UI ended, kids are going back to school, so on and so forth. Maybe that's when labor force participation picks up. You know, I think you can tell a lot of this story around a forecast that just makes a number of mistakes. And I'm not saying it would have been easy to make a forecast, but. Yeah. All right, Kylie, finally. Um, so maybe uh, two observations and one, then one question in the form of a comment. Um, <laughs> observation number one, when I look back at the, uh, so it certainly resonated with me, Goiti's, you know, uh, description of the framework as creating asymmetry, which has an inflation bias. And that, of course, was meant, I think, to offset the downward inflation bias. Yes in work that, you know, associated with low R star. In that model, it's low R star driven primarily by aggregate demand shocks, and it's desirable to have an overshooting type policy. When I think of that literature, though, that overshooting is described in terms of inflation, not in terms of the unemployment rate. Now, it is the case that if aggregate demand is driving everything, those are the same. But when I think about the work I did with John Roberts or, or with Ben or others, it was always expressed in terms of inflation because actually supply and demand factors are both important and inflation will better capture those. And so I think it was a, 
perhaps uh, an over-optimization to a world in which demand is the primary driver and R star is low, and that thinking more flexibly would have sort of uh, leaned against the asymmetry in uh, output or unemployment. I think secondarily related to that, our models suggest that lower unemployment is desirable. That does not mean that lower unemployment should be ignored in setting monetary policy. So in our standard New Keynesian model, the equilibrium level of unemployment is inefficient and it's desirable to have lower unemployment. That doesn't lead to a loss function of the type that Ellen described that's used in, in some optimal control simulations at the Fed in 2016, where you ignore it, right? It just says, well, it's desirable to have it somewhat lower, but you should still be responding to lower inflation, right? There are still costs, I mean, to lower unemployment, there are still costs. Um, and so in broad terms, the framework seemed to over-optimize to this demand world. And, you know, I think we have a long history in monetary policy research where optimizing your framework to a specific model will lead to a bad outcome, right? That you should attenuate your, your responses in any individual model or framework because the framework's very uncertain. Nonetheless, I, I wonder how different outcomes would have been. And in particular, I wonder your views on if the framework had been perfectly symmetric whether or not the real challenge was associated with having a forecast targeting framework and the forecast always be that next year we'll have Goldilocks. Next year, inflation will be 2% and next year, unemployment will be near its natural rate, even if we don't do anything. And, and that really has nothing to do with asymmetries, right? That is a view of where the economy is going. Thanks. Rich and then David and then we're going to move. Uh, I'll be quick. I, what I would say is to Jason's point about that period, one reason why, in retrospect, Jason would give it an A minus is that the Fed in real time, including when I was there, essentially had to ignore backward looking models that said inflation would surge when the unemployment rate got above five. Indeed, the committee lifted off in December of 2015 when the unemployment rate was at five because the Fed models were saying it would take off. Um, and the Powell Fed certainly at that point became very, very skeptical that we should base policy on, on that model simply because you kept falling with no cost push pressure. So I think there's an opportunity cost clearly, uh, but there's also an opportunity cost to running a policy that's, that's very, very tight because the model keeps looking at inflation to, to go up. Um, and I think that's also relevant. Yeah. David, can you wave your hand so they can find you? <laughs> coming from behind you. In the interest of brevity, I'll suppress most of what I had planned as a bless you. to. Um, listening to the discussion, it seems to me that one factor that has been uh, greatly understated is the profound uncertainty that policymakers and, frankly, staff forecasters face in the moment. And I think there's a, a tremendous risk of overlearning the lessons of the last uh, three years because the last time we had a shock of this nature was, uh, as best as I can tell, approximately the influence of 1919, 18 and 19. Um, the next time we have a experience like that, I hope we'll look back. I think there are important lessons to learn, but my guess is that the primary danger we face today is overlearning the lesson of a highly atypical shock and forgetting that at least or uh, underappreciating that in my view I think we're headed back to the environment of the 2010s where the primary challenge is indeed a low R star and uh, the risk of sinking into a morass of inflation expectations that are eroding and monetary policy becoming increasingly incapable of combating that. I, I agree, and I think the other thing I should have mentioned earlier is that uh, this is an interim assessment, and if we get through this period in the next two years with a soft or softish landing, we may decide that we took a risk and it was worth taking and it wasn't such a bad outcome. And we won't know that for a few years. And, and history will judge this a lot more on things that have yet to happen. So with that, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> and then we're going to make a slight change in the program. Uh, for, before we move to the full panel on what should be in the next framework review, uh, Chris and Forbes.
from MIT, a former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, and an all-around good person, uh, has some slides, and she's going to share them, and then I'm going to bring up the whole panel. So, Chris. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Congratulations to Dave and the, the team for putting together this event and having people start to think about the framework review in advance. There's clearly some room for improvement this time around. Um, so Dave has asked me to talk about what should be on the agenda for the framework review. What should we think about? But to do that, I think I need to first take a step back and say, what has changed? Why should we be thinking about changes to the framework review? And I want to highlight three sets of changes. Uh, the role of global shocks, high inflation in the Phillips curve, and the, where policy rates are now. Many of these are obvious, but I think it's just where, and many of them have been talked about already this morning, but it's worth just running through quickly because the world today does look quite different than it did in 2019, 2020, when the framework review was happening. And it's these changes which are the main reason we are talking about changing, uh, rethinking some of the uh, framework. Um, and then I'll end with what's next for the framework review. Okay, so first, what's changed in the global environment? Let me start with the role of global shocks. Um, as usual at a Fed conference, we don't talk much about what's going on in the rest of the global economy. Richard, thank you for bringing that in. Uh, but uh, the, the key point I want to make is that global shocks are increasingly important in driving headline inflation, CPI inflation. This is an update of a graph I actually presented here, gosh, before COVID, when I did a Brookings paper on the role of globalization in affecting inflation. And the main takeaway from a typical Brookings paper, you know, about 80 pages, but it can be quickly summarized in this is that global shocks are increasingly driving CPI inflation. This is the first principal component of CPI inflation in red. It shows that CPI inflation around the world is increasingly driven by shocks like oil shocks, commodity shocks, global supply chain issues, global slack. Um, so that is, um, but also important is core inflation, wage inflation is affected a bit more by global shocks, but not much more. Core inflation, wage inflation, is still largely a domestic process. Um, and that agrees with the results in the paper by Ben and Olivier. Uh, and here's just a, the graphs that they showed us. If you look at what drives CPI inflation over the past couple of years, global shocks, food and energy shocks, were a key driver. But when you look at wage inflation, the global shocks have been a much, played a much more minor role. Um, so I think that's important for a couple of reasons as we think about a framework. The first key takeaway from this is that in any point in time, in any year, it's going to be really hard to hit a CPI inflation target. And even core can bounce around some because of these global shocks. So trying to set a mandate where you're supposed to hit a target in a specific target in any given month is just asking too much. You don't want monetary policy to go up and down to try to hit that specific target in any given period when these global forces are going to drive inflation away from a target and by large amounts. At least the U.S. has a big advantage over most other countries where the target is core inflation, so you get away from some of this. But I think there should still be some more flexibility because these global shocks do matter so much. Um, also, one reason why uh, you might say we don't need to worry so much about the global shocks um, if they do largely fade and pass away is because inflation expectations have remained anchored, as again we saw in the first paper. So there hasn't been much passed through of this period of sustained high inflation on wage setting. Um, but I'm not sure we can claim victory on that quite yet. The verdict is still out. We may, we'd love to see this updated in a couple of years for the U.S. And also important in other countries, it's not clear inflation expectations have been as well anchored. Uh, the U.K. is a prime example where we've seen uh, high inflation, largely driven initially by external shocks. It has passed through into the wage and price setting process to a larger degree. It does seem to have unanchored inflation expectations during a period when the Bank of England was raising rates at a slower pace. So I don't think we can claim victory here, um, even if the global shocks are usually more transitory effects on headline inflation. They still can pass through. Okay, second change in the global environment, other than, or in the uh, macro environment, other than an increased role of global shocks, is that inflation is back. Uh, this just shows the share of countries that have inflation too hot, just about right, or too cold. This is a set of advanced economies, independent central banks, inflation targeting, et cetera. Um, I mean, we all know inflation has been too high in most countries around the world. 
But it's important to note that the period when this framework was done was that period where there was a lot of green and blue when inflation was too low. I don't think anyone working on the framework then foresaw how quickly inflation could come back and be high. So it just was not dealing with a world where inflation is very high was, was not central, and that's why it was easier to write an asymmetric framework uh, because high inflation just was not seen as a major risk. It's back. Um, related to that, uh, we had a lot of talk today about the Phillips curve. Is the Phillips curve alive? Is it flat? Is it steep? Um, I, I will skip some of that discussion, but I just want to make a couple important points about the Phillips curve. Uh, the Phillips, the, on the left is the original Phillips curve, as Phillips do it for the U.S. What's important from this is it is not a straight line. It is nonlinear. It is a curve. Somehow we seem to have forgotten that in much of the discussion that especially preceded uh, 2020. Uh, when unemployment is higher and unemployment falls, or when unemployment is above NARU and unemployment falls, there's not much effect on wage, wages. Uh, when unemployment falls quite low and is below NARU, then when unemployment falls further, there's going to be a bigger effect on wages. Um, this is just on the uh, right, an estimate of this. When you, but it's very hard to estimate that in real time for any country. Um, if you do it cross-country, shown on the right, you do get it's this sort of curved effect. There's now a series of papers that are starting to be written on how the Phillips curve is back and how it's nonlinear. And I think we just need to remember this lesson. There will be periods the relationship between unemployment and wage inflation seems weak. But if you push the labor market hard enough that unemployment is very low and well below any sort of equilibrium rate, you're going to eventually have some effect on wages. Um, Estimating exactly what that, that point where the break happens, though, is very hard in real time. The curve shifts, it tilts, it flattens. Um, the break point can move based on structural changes on where your neighbor is. So, you know, very hard to use in real time. But I think that concept is important to remember. If you push the labor market too hard and unemployment falls too low, again, you will get wage pressures and inflationary pressures. So you have to have that involved in the framework. It's not free to push the labor market too low, too hard. Final point on how things have changed is interest rates. Uh, a lot of the concern um, which drove some of the changes in the framework review was that interest rates would remain very low, so there was not space to lower them further when the next shot hit to stimulate the economy. So here's a graph of some interest rates in some of the big advanced economies. Um, people have talked to you for a while, so now I want to have you think for a second. Just look at that for a minute. Apologies to a few of you who saw me present this uh, last week in Florida. Uh, so look at interest rates, policy interest rates in major economies. A couple of things might jump out at you. One, for the U.S., we set a band now, not a rate. So five and, five and a quarter, let's say that's the top of the band, five to five and a quarter where the U.S. rate is today. Anything else jump out at you is odd. I'm tempted to call on you, David, David, but you might have seen my slides, so you know it's coming. Uh, for those of you who follow markets minutely, you might notice the U.K. looks off a little. U.K. Uh, bank rate is now at 4.5%. But market expectations are that it'll go to about five. So, so maybe this actually shows where policy rates are expected to settle during this hiking cycle. But a couple of you might notice something else off. It's not that MIT RAs have gotten uh, unreliable. Instead, what it is, is this is actually not policy interest rates today. It's rates in 20, at the end of 2006. The right is where policy interest rates are today. The average is basically the same. And I think this is just, a, a, I picked the year on purpose, obviously. Um, but look at how similar these rates are. U.S. basically the same. You know, U.K. is expected to uh, go where it was in 2006. Many of the others basically the same. I think this is just a reminder. We've, we spent, a lot of the framework review was on the period that was from the 2010s. We thought the world was different. Rates would be lower, inflation lower, less concerned about a Phillips curve. Um, but... The world today might actually be just more of a return to a more normal world of the 1990s, 2000s. We don't know. We don't know what world we're going back to. We could be going back to a world of the 2010s, where these interest rates get low again, inflation is low again, or we might just be back to a world as pre-2010. And that requires a different framework. 
So that's the key sort of takeaways I thought about this in, in aligns with the, the second paper by uh, Gauti and Don, is we need a framework that will fit these different environments. We don't know where the world is going. We don't know if inflation will be a big problem in the future. We don't know where policy interest rates will settle. We need a framework that is nimble enough for all of those. So what's that mean concretely? Um, first, uh, and I'll, I'll focus the changes on how these relate to some of these changes in the, in the macro environment. Uh, global shocks are going to continue to be important in driving headline inflation, potentially core inflation, and potentially risks of feeding through into the wage and price setting process. So it's, it's just going to be hard to meet any 2% goal in any month. These global shocks matter. They're big. They're not going away. So I would, I think, on the table should be the consideration of a more flexible numeric target, not having to hit 2%. It was Jason had just said, maybe we shouldn't have done so much hand-wringing about being at 1.8%. That shouldn't be a failure. That doesn't sound so bad, given the role of these big global shocks. So maybe we should have a band, 1.5% to 2.5%, and not, again, have to feel like you have to go to extraordinary measures because you're off by a bit, given the role of global shocks. Maybe we should shift to a model something like the Bank of England does, where you aren't aiming to hit a target in any given month, but you are adjusting policy interest rates to have inflation go to a 2% in two years' time. So you let the global shocks fade, and your goal is to hit that target in a certain window and not in any given month. Um, and in and the, and the same vein, I, I think it's very important to, now that we are in a world of higher inflation, uh, rely less on forward guidance maintain more flexibility. I think this was a, a mistake um, as we emerged from COVID of the, the uh, Fed tying its hands with its guidance, with its commitment about what it would take before it started to tighten monetary policy, and also tying its hands through its QE program by being so hesitant to talk about talking about tapering and then talk about tapering and finally tapering that made it harder for them to adjust rates in a more timely fashion. So beware of any of these sorts of policies that make you lose your guidance you need, or lose your flexibility. You need to be nimble, to use Dave's words. Um, uh, in terms of the changes where we are now in a world of higher inflation, where the Phillips curve is alive, or at least on the steeper part of it, um, I think we do need to bring back a focus on the risks around inflation to the framework of view, back to a more symmetric framework, you know, echoing the comments we just had in the last, last paper, um, allowing the Fed to be able to adjust rates preemptively to labor market deviations in both directions. The asymmetry made sense if you thought we would always be in a world of the 2010s of low inflation, flat part of the Phillips curve, but we're not. Um, we need to bring the symmetry back. Um, and then the final so key consideration is with policy rates now well above the effective lower bounds, I think there's less concern about limited policy space. Again, I don't know where rates will settle. I think they'll probably come down, but probably not as low as they were uh, b before COVID hit. Um, and this is where I think it would be, this would be a good opportunity to clarify the framework for other monetary policy tools. We've actually talked quite little about this whole new set of tools, which are now a standard part of the toolkit. Um, and in particular, talking about when you use uh, asset purchases, uh, talk about limiting asset purchases so they're easier to get out of when it's time to end an asset purchase program, so it won't then take longer to adjust policy rates. And also something which I can't believe we've avoided most of the day, some discussion of how you use asset purchases for financial stability concerns if you may be adjusting interest rates in a different direction. For example, the dilemma the Bank of England was in in October with the LDI crisis when they wanted to tighten monetary policy because inflation was still too high, but yet they had to buy assets for financial stability issues. Um, I think it would be useful to clarify in advance ways that can be done, a separate, uh, separate facility, a separate name, so it's clear you're not doing QE while you're raising interest rates. You're doing asset purchases for financial stability reasons, shorter term, limited duration. You unwind them quickly like the Bank of England did. Clarifying that in advance would be helpful. It's part of the framework of you. So finally, I think those are some of my suggestions, at least to get the conversation going on what should be looked at in the framework review. I think what's also important, though, is what is not up there. 
Uh, one thing that is not up there is going back to more formal rules. That was at a Fed conference in Atlanta, uh, in Florida last week, and there was a push for sort of more tailor rules, more formal rules. Um, I, I, I don't think that makes sense, especially given all these structural changes. Also, what I did not put up there was shifting to a higher inflation target. I'm also surprised we have not had that discussion yet. Uh, probably we will on the next panel, but I'll, I'll leave that discussion for the next panel. Thank you. Thanks. So if I can call uh, Ben and Olivier, Ellen, and Rich up here, and because we only have five seats, I'm going to stand. And I'm sure that if Jason or Gauti, Gauti or Don has anything to say, uh, I'll find a way to conclude it. A little behind schedule, we're going to go like 15 minutes over. I think that uh, Kristen gave a good start to what I was hoping we can do in this session, which is try and put a few things on the table uh, for the Fed when they revisit the framework, which um, they're scheduled, scheduled to do in 2025. I think somebody suggested, someone I know suggested to Jay Powell that they do it sooner, and he winced. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and maybe some of these issues will be clearer by then. Uh, maybe some of the, maybe uh, Kristen's chart of interest rates will look less like 2006 and more like 2019. We just don't know yet. But, um, Ben, I wonder if I could start with you. Um, before the Fed put out its framework, you had articulated, I think it was a speech at Peterson, where you talked about temporary price level targeting. And the idea was that we'd have an inflation target in normal times, but when we ran into this awkward situation of the zero lower bound, then we'd have a period where they would target the price level. And I wonder, um, in light of that, and there was a lot of similarity to that in the new Fed framework, do you think that that's a good idea? Do you think that the framework should be different in 2025, given what we've just gone through? Or do you think we landed in a good place and we just had a bad run? I, I, don't, I don't think the temporary price level target has anything to do with what Don and Galti were talking about, which was the lack of preemption and holding to zero. The temporary price level target doesn't talk about employment. It's about, and we had a paper with John, I had a paper with John Roberts and Michael Kiley where we did simulations to try to figure out what was optimal. And what we found was it, it really, once inflation had been established at target for around a year, then you could begin a process of, of increasing. Um, as some, as I think Kristen pointed, others pointed out, um, when you have uh, a downward bias on inflation because of the uh, effect of lower bound, if your target, and maybe this, is, maybe this should be formal, if your target is, say, inflation or inflation expectations in two years, then there's got to be periods of overshoot. And that's just part, that's the logic of this. Um, I, I think the, the re revision is going to have to take into account the fact that you know, that we won't be necessarily at the zero lower bound, you know, all the time, like we thought might be the case before. But this, that should still be in it because that, you know, when you're at the lower bound, you've got to compensate for the fact that, you know, you're not able to keep inflation up to the target all the time. You need to have some overshoot. So I, I don't think anything... What would you do different if you were rewriting the framework now, the 2020 framework? Well, um... Again, I think, I think there's, um, it depends how much you think of the September, December 2020 um, guidance as part of the framework. If it's not part of the framework, then I think I would be a little more fuzzy about the em full employment concept, recognize that there are multiple indicators, for example, that should be taken into account. Um, I would talk about... Uh, having a period of time to reach the target that, you know, it doesn't have to be at the target all the time. Um, on forward guidance, I think, um, so I don't want to go into Odyssean versus Delphic forward guidance. I think there are times at lower bound where, where very tough, for, very clear, explicit forward guidance is quite helpful. Um, and so that should be part of the toolkit. When you're away from the zero lower bound, transparency demands that you give some idea of where you think the economy and policy are going, but it could be very general. And in those cases, 
Um, I think that we, we, the Fed, not we anymore, the Fed needs to have a better way of communicating that these are very provisional, these are subject to change, and, and so on. Um, so an indicator of the certainty of the guidance as well as the guidance itself would probably be a useful addition. Hmm. Rich, uh, okay, we give you full credit for all the good parts and the bad parts of the framework, uh, but you're no longer at the board. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I want to compliment both Gauti and, and uh, Olivier have been quite uh, humble and say where they made mistakes. So I want to invite you to follow <laughs> in that spirit. What, not what would you have done differently in 2020, because you've talked a lot about that, but if we we're revisiting the framework yeah. in light of recent experience, what would you recommend? What issues be on the table? Well, this has been a, a great session. I do appreciate as well the idea that this will become a lot clearer when we actually see how this episode uh, uh, ends up, but I appreciate getting a head start on it. I'd say a couple of things. I think you know within within the building, and when we did the framework review, it was pre-pandemic, uh, so we were still in the Eccles uh, building. Um, we always thought of the framework statement itself as, and I think Jim Bullard has used this term, quasi-constitutional. The the framework statement has no nothing in it about forward guidance, uh, QE, as did the 2012 statement had no reference to that uh, either. So in our own mind and in my mind, I always thought about the framework statement as defining goals um, and uh, and priorities, and then the implementation, obviously. Um, myself, I think I gave six speeches as vice chair, including two at Brookings, uh, on how I read the framework statement and implementation. And to me, the most straightforward way to do it was essentially for the committee to decide, based upon having been at the zero bound, when it would make sense to lift off using the totality of data, labor market data, inflation expectations, and then at that point to essentially revert to traditional inflation targeting. I still think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's entirely consistent with the existing uh, uh, language, uh, but certainly uh, I, I think in something in that direction makes sense. Um, uh, I, I will say that um, you know, with forward guidance, like with, with any, you know, the law of diminishing returns is relevant. There are, there are costs and benefits. Um, and certainly if you look at the forward guidance the, the committee uh, offered in September of 2020 and December of 2020, um, you know, the cost benefit of the guidance on the balance sheet, um, I think was a close call then and in retrospect, uh, I think, and I made this point in, in some talks I gave here and papers I've given, I think, I think the guidance, very specific guidance on tapering and talking about tapering did put in a lag of, any, of several months, six months, some number of time, amount of time uh, between when uh, a liftoff would have been called for and when the commi committee did. Uh, so I think, you know, critically thinking about cost-benefit of guidance uh, is, is, uh, is, is relevant because obviously one option is if the world changes, you just abandon the guidance. But what was interesting about being on the committee at that time was that there was a perceived cost of abandoning the guidance given the prior commitment. So I think I'd make those two points. Hmm. Um, Ellen, you look like you had wisdom to share. No, I just wanted to follow up with a comment on the, the tapering and the guidance around that. You know, this is another place where I think mindset and what you bring from past experience um, were formative. You know, back in 2012, there was this little episode called the taper tantrum, and, uh, and it really did um, ruffle uh, the Fed, and, and communications had to be worked out, and uh, you know, I remember uh, then Chair Bernanke saying tapering is not tightening. Uh, I don't know how many times he used that phrase to, um, to convince markets that, you know, uh, a discussion of tapering did not mean that the Fed was going to lift the policy rate from zero uh, eminently. And so the whole procedure that was laid out, which really made sense at the time because the recovery was so slow, allowed the Fed to proceed very, very slowly. And even then, once tapering ended, there was still more than 12 months before the policy rate was lifted. You know, picking that apparatus up and plopping it down into the current um, environment really was just not the right approach this time. And so I, I really agree that, you know, that whole thing needs to be looked at, including uh, the idea that you might 
begin to lift off uh, before your taper is completed as suggested. Uh, okay, so I'll, just to make sure I understand, Rich, I think you're saying not much needs to be changed in the framework, but we need to give more thought to how we use forward guidance. And Ellen is saying a good research question before the we get into this again is how do we think about tapering and stock versus flow? I just have a quick comment on that. One partial solution is to when you do QE programs, do a fixed amount for a fixed time. Uh, I, I, the but Fed that has be, downsides as well. Right, but the Fed should be credited for being sensitive to the risks around tapering. When the Fed adjusts its program, there could be global implications, and it's very hard to assess what those are. So big credit to the Fed for being more sensitive. Um, but a good counterexample is the Bank of England. When they did their QE programs, they announced a fixed quantity, which so the default was it ended. And then you didn't have to worry about messaging how do you end, getting ready to talk about it. Um, there's a, the default built into markets is an end date. And that end date is often wrong. I think the Bank of England probably ended a little. But at least there's an end date on the books. That's the default. Um, and if it's not enough, which often happens, then you can always do more. But that, then you get, if anything, the announcement effect of doing more. But again, it's the end is marked, priced in, marked in, less risk of ending it. And if the date's off by a couple months, that's still a lot easier yeah. than a six month. I'm struck by how hard it is to about. focus the conversation on strategy because we keep going to tactics. Um, Olivier, uh, well, I you saw you making some notes, so I don't want to preempt anything you'd say, but I am interested in your current views on if the Fed is revisiting the inflation target in 2025, what would be the smart thing to do then, given what you've said in the past? So. I think in the abstract, the argument for having a higher target inflation remains very strong. And Kristen may be right that the R star will be sufficiently high that we don't have to worry. But I worry. I mean, I remember what the assess probability was when we decided on 2%, which was zero, and it turned out to be 100. Uh, <laughs> so, it seems to me that it would be good to increase the inflation target. I used to be of a 4% uh, opinion. I've concluded, based on a number of papers, that at 4% there is salience about inflation, and that starts changing behavior in ways which complicate the task of a, of a central bank. So I've downgraded to 3, from 2 to 3. Uh, what I hear is, well, 1%, who cares? 1% is what we got by doing QE. So one way of thinking about it is, if we had had a target of 1% more, maybe we would not have had to do QE, and I think on net, we would probably be better off. I mean, QE is a very complicated uh, uh, set of measures to use with many, many, many adverse effects. So. This is in the abstract. I realize that at this stage, the central banks don't want to talk about it because they want disinflation and they don't want to change the target. And it would be counterproductive for them to talk about it. But almost surely, there is going to be a point where the issue is going to be there, which, uh, where the rubber is going to hit the road, if I remember the US expression for that. Uh, <laughs> which is, you know, in the next six months, it's likely we'll be around three. And given that the wage Phillips curve is very flat, getting to two is not going to be trivial. And it may be very hard for the Fed to say, well, we have to go to two, and we're going to keep interest rates very high. I suspect what's going to happen is that the Fed is going to be more relaxed. It's not going to change the target, but it may not be in a hurry to get to two. And maybe along the way, there's a discussion. Uh, but I think the argument is still very much there. Ben, you agree? Well, I agree in theory. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the actual reality doesn't, doesn't really support it. Um, one thing nobody talks about is politics. Um, the Congress let us put in an inflation target without being part of the process. And I had to consult widely with that. Um, I remember we were here, and uh, Janet Yellen put up a, a, a video of um, the head of the House Financial Services Committee saying, under no circumstances will you raise the inflation target. I think if you did it, you would have to consult with Congress, and you might find out at the end that your inflation target is one. 
<laughs> so I, I think it's a, it's a very big issue. The second thing is that, you know, um, whatever would have been the theoretical right thing in the beginning, and I think it's debatable, uh, right now there's some very heavy barriers to making a change. Obviously, with inflation high, you don't want to, you know, give up the credibility that you're serious about inflation. You don't want to change where the target is so that you can you know, put it around the, the, the arrow. Um, but the other part is um, we've had a de facto 2% inflation target in the U.S. since the 90s, and uh, that's built up a lot of credibility and expectation. I, th I think the change would, I mean, I, again, you know, I'm just trying to bring out all the issues, I think, of reality. Uh, the change would be difficult to maneuver and get people to find it credible. Um, it would have disruptive effects on bond markets, for example. So I understand completely the argument in favor. Um, and I've seen papers that you know, say it would make a big difference. I think we got more than 1% out of QE, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, there, are, there are some real, given where we are today, right. as opposed to starting from, from you know, the original position, of, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it would be quite a challenge to make that change. Uh, Carola, I should have asked people to identify themselves before, so I'll ask it now. Sure. Hi, I'm Carola Binder from Haverford College. Um, my question is about the, the role of possible Fed listens events in the next framework review. Um, I think the Fed listens events that were in like 2019, 2020, those are at the same time as there were a lot of um, a lot of papers, op-eds, conferences about the p possible threat of populism to central bank. And in some ways, I saw them as like maybe a response to that, to kind of like let's respond to what the public wants so that they will let us be independent. Um, so I wonder like to what extent any of you think that the Fed Listens events um, led, to some mis led to some of the problems with the new framework and whether they are necessary or a good idea for the next framework review. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, I think for the Fed to seek input in that format um, was was not only important, but I think will be durable. You know, what the Fed does with that input is up to the the committee's professional uh, uh, judgment. I, I think that there are a lot of elements of the framework that uh, are worth uh, revisiting, but I think one that has a lot of support, certainly w when I left, and I haven't heard any comments to the contrary, was... Um, uh, what was Fed listened, uh, but um, uh, but again, that's that's one of many inputs the committee w will have. I think they will keep it in place uh, to make the show. While I've got the microphone, I want to second something Kristen uh, said in our framework review. In the we released ex we then when I was there released extensive. We had seven rounds of briefings at the FOMC from from system staff. It wasn't just a board effort. And actually, one of those briefings was a dedicated briefing on thinking about defining the inflation objective explicitly in terms of a band or a range. Uh, we chose, we, they, the committee chose not to go down that road given the initial conditions, because the concern was if the committee were to define a range of, you know, one and a half to two and a half, that could reinforce the view that inflation would never get to do and then, and then reinforce the challenge of inflation expectations sagging. So, wanting to get away from the 2% as a ceiling perception, which other central banks have had to uh, confront. Um, uh, but, but the initial conditions will be much different in 2024 and 2025, and I, think, I would hope that the merits of seriously considering a range could be uh, entertained, because I think Kristen is right. When you're a central banker, there are always shocks, uh, maybe fewer in the U.S. than in the U.K., but there are always shocks, and success is really keeping inflation expectations anchored. Um, and I think you can achieve that with, with a well thought through and communicated range. So I would hope that the committee does consider that next time. Lisa, wait a minute. Let's go Sack first. Brian Sack. The idea that there would be a silence and no one asking a question is just too much for <laughs> Lisa to take. Uh, when I ask a question, it's actually similar to a question I asked Rich in Hoover, I think in 2019. <laughs> Which is, um, I mean, if you could measure intermediate-term inflation expectations 
accurately, right? I mean, wouldn't the robust, the most robust framework approach be just put that in your, your reaction function and, and react to it? I mean, all these things about the lower bound causing this chronic bias, I mean, you could see that in five-year, five-year break-evens. I'm not saying that's the measure, the perfect measure, but, you know, they were below two from 2014 through 2019. They reflected this bias. But it seems like something like that, like I think everyone, almost any framework is going to agree that you want to make sure your long-term inflation expectations are anchored. So to me, that seems like the right. most you know, robust idea is just to react to that to make sure that those are at a level consistent with your target. I was wondering if you had any comment. I, I have a paper with Michael Woodford. He did all the hard math. Um, which shows that you get circularity in that kind of situation, that, that the Fed says we're going to target 2%. The market says, oh, okay, we'll expect 2%. And there's really, you sort of can get to multiple equilibria. And there, there are actually some problems with that. But, but I, I, on, the, on the other hand, I have advocated what Lars Svensson calls inflation forecast targeting. And, you know, in principle, when you have lags, you, you don't want it to be at 2%, you know, on every Tuesday. You want, you want to have a, a, a path that takes you to 2% over a period of time. And I think one of the dimensions, I think several people have already said this, one of the ways in which you can uh, improve the trade-off against employment is to be flexible in how long you take to, to get to the official target. Steve? Oh, please, yeah. Wait for the mic so people on the great beyond can hear your thoughts. Okay, uh, the circularity is a very good point, but I mean, the whole experience from 2014 to 2019, I mean, we did see inflation expectations at least measured in some measures, like looking too low. So it's not like it's a meaningless, you know, idea that, you know, hey, policy should react to that and, and, and be looser to address that. So, um, Steve? Then I'm going to, after Steve's question, I'm going to ask each of you to put even if you've said it before, one thing you think should be on the agenda when the Fed revisits the review when Ellen Mead comes back to run it in 2025. <laughs> uh, David, sorry, this, this perkins back to maybe the last panel. I wonder if Olivier and Ben would talk about the possibilities or probabilities of the immaculate disinflationary outcome from your paper. To the extent that it seemed reliant on going back to the prior efficiency of labor allocation, before the pandemic, it doesn't seem like an incredibly improbable outcome. So I just wonder if you might adjust that. Thanks. Well, again, you, there's an extended debate between Chris Waller and Andrew Figura and uh, Blanchard, Domash, and Summers about the likelihood of this. Apparently, historically, that doesn't happen very often. But of course, this is a very unusual situation. Um, the, the issue is we don't fully understand why the beverage curve moved out. It has to do, to some extent, perhaps, uh, with more reallocation taking place in the economy. It could be that people are more reluctant to come back to work, and therefore they don't search as intensively. So it could be, I, I raised the possibility without having any sense of probability, that um, uh, over time we move in some direction, you know, to some, you know, back towards the original beverage curve, which would make the unemployment cost much less. Um, it's not, yeah, so, but we don't know. Uh, Olivier pointed out that the most recent readings, unemployment has stayed about the same, or actually dropped a little bit while the number of vacancies has come down. So, so far so good for the, you know, for the immaculate disinflation folks. Okay, one, one thing that should definitely be on the Fed's agenda when it revisits the review. Do you want to start, Ellen? So I, I'd like to follow up on this uh, comment that Don made about um, a little bit more discussion in the committee. Um, while there were, I think it was, five meetings at which uh, framework review topics were discussed, there was never a go-round on the draft consensus statement that took place in a meeting. And, um, you know, it, I went back to the December 2011 meeting uh, as I was preparing for this, and that's really quite a discussion and quite an interesting thing about what is a framework statement, what should be in a framework statement, how do I as a policymaker see a framework statement. So I think I would encourage the committee to uh, have a discussion that five years or six years later we could 
uh, read and get a sense of their views. Rich? Well, I already weighed in on the idea of, of taking the, the range of the band uh, uh, seriously. But, but the other I would mention, and I want to second, I think, what was mentioned in some earlier panels, I, I think putting some meat on the bones of what is, what is a you know, broad-based definition of full employment, there are ways to make that operational, uh, including using you know, uh, labor market condition indexes, for example, the Kansas City Fed, or even tying a tight labor market to some notion of the level of you know, w uh, wage gains consistent with productivity, I think would be quite uh, uh, useful. No one's happy with putting all the eggs in the U-star basket since it moves uh, around. And so putting some time, if not in the framework statement, then into operationalizing it, I think would be quite helpful. Because as my, as my chart showed, both the Kansas City 18 indicator index uh, and the VU index were essentially saying mission accomplished by the fall of 2021. Well, I would say a band, but since uh, Rich okay. just said it, I'll say <laughs> back to um, a more symmetric framework. So the Fed can preemptively address risks that when inflation is picking up too quickly, not just when inflation is too low. Olivier? So I was very much taken by Christine's first point about the role of global shocks. I mean, and they, maybe the recommendation is even more for Europe, which is more or less only affected by global shocks at this stage. And it clearly limits the ambition of any central bank when you have these very large shocks. And that has to be taken into account more explicitly. Ben? Well, I guess I would say that uh, there should be something about, given the lags of monetary policy, that the outlook has to be considered in making policy decisions with due, uh, due attention to the uncertainty necessarily associated with uh, outlook. So I, I guess that's just the back door way of bringing back uh, a little bit of preemption. Great. So I want to thank everybody, including our panelists and Ben and, and Goiti and Jason Furman. And uh, I want to thank uh, my team, uh, Stephanie Sensula and Howen Chen, who managed to pull off an event with the RES events manager on vacation. And thank all of you for your attention and coming. And uh, you can rewatch this whole thing at your leisure, at faster or slower speeds, depending on your taste.